June 21, 1999 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Hart Family Files Lawsuit Against WWF, WCW Great American Bash Review, more. By Observer Staff. The expected lawsuit filed by the Hart Family against a number of defendants, the main one being the World Wrestling Federation, was announced at a press conference on June 15 in Kansas City. The lawsuit filed in the Circuit Court of Jackson County, Missouri due to Missouri Rule 55.05 is prohibited from naming a specific dollar amount. The lawsuit only requests of the jury damages that are fair and reasonable and also claims that WWF and other defendants should be liable for punitive damages claiming they ignored and sacrificed safety in favor of risky stunts. The lawsuit was filed listing Martha Hart, her children Uya and Athena, and Owen's parents Stu and Helen Hart as plaintiffs. Stu, Helen, Martha and Bret Hart appeared at the press conference and asked the media from this point forward not to ask any more questions regarding the case as they would not be commenting on pending litigation. Hart's attorneys, Gary C. Robb and Anita Port Robb of Kansas City and Edward Papella and Pamela Fisher of Calgary also refused further comment on the case. WWF officials also declined comment on the case until seeing the lawsuit itself. The lawsuit lists as defendants the World Wrestling Federation, Titan Sports Incorporated, Vince McMahon, Amspec Incorporated, Lumar Marine, Lift All Company, responsible for the manufacturing of both the harness and cable equipment used in the stunt, Linda McMahon as well as the individuals who set up the rigging. James Williams, Bobby Talbert, Matt Allman and Jim Vincent as well as the City of Kansas City, as owners of Kemper Arena, claiming negligence in the stunt. The basic claim of the suit is that the WWF failed to provide safe and proper equipment for the 78-foot drop. The police investigation has revised the estimate of how far the fall was from the original 91 feet. We just offered the facility, said Kemper Arena General Manager Alan Schmelzel. None of our employees or equipment had anything to do with the accident. My children have lost their father, and I have lost the love of my life, because of the greed of the WWF and its insistence that its wrestlers take ever greater chances to attract entertainment dollars in this era of extreme sports, said Martha Hart. My hope is that this lawsuit will help prevent more loss of life and that other sports families will not have to endure the kind of pain we've experienced. The 118-page lawsuit lists 46 counts against the 13 defendants. At press time we were unable to review the suit but will have a more detailed view of it in next week's issue. The controversy over the non-stoppage of the show was also an issue in an AP story on the lawsuit, with Martha Hart saying she was repulsed that the show continued after her husband's fall. Alan Schmelzel, the general manager of Kemper Arena, stated the decision to continue was not out of disrespect for Hart. Honestly, we didn't know at that point if he was dead, Schmelzel said, which at this point in time with what has come out regarding the actual time of death and when the people making the decisions backstage were aware of it is a pretty flawed argument. An emotional Martha Hart at the press conference said that she wishes her husband's legacy would be to result in an improvement in the safety conditions for the performers in the industry. A separate criminal investigation remains ongoing. According to the Kansas City Star, Police Major Gregory Mills was quoted as saying, I'm looking at the rigging. I have a concern whether this was the safest way to do the stunt. The police investigation is concerned with whether the proper equipment was used for the stunt and was it being used in the correct way, and was Owen Hart properly trained to perform such a stunt. We will be seeking expert advice to help us draw some conclusions, he said. We can't say if it was right or wrong or if due caution was taken. What we do know is that in attempting to do that stunt, Owen Hart died. There is no specific person being investigated for possible criminal charges, which at this point are first to investigate the circumstances leading to the accident, and then figuring out who is responsible for those circumstances. If someone is to be charged in the case, the charge would likely be involuntary manslaughter involving reckless conduct leading to a death. For the case to bring a conviction, prosecutors would have to prove the defendant disregarded a substantial risk and deviated from what a reasonable person would do under similar circumstances. Realistically, it is going to be difficult to pinpoint any specific individual or individuals for criminal aspects of potential negligence. Mills discounted foul play, stating Hart was not pushed off the catwalk, the equipment used to lower him doesn't appear to have been tampered with and he said the police know that nobody else pulled the ring to trigger the automatic release. It happened while Owen Hart was hanging there. He was the only one there when it happened. His fall had nothing to do with an overt act by someone else. It is not unusual to have a single movement quick release on such a stunt. Hart used a teardrop-shaped mechanism that opens like handcuffs, as opposed to a three-ring mechanism that you have to completely pull out for the rope to detach. Stunts using a single movement detach mechanism are not unusual in movies. 
Rina Mero's appearance on WCW Nitro on June 14th while still under contract to the WWF raises a lot of legal questions. Mero was seated in the front row at Nitro with numerous camera close-ups, coming out just before 10 p.m. and a Kevin Nash interview. The crowd reacted big to her, to the point that while Nash was attempting to do his interview there was a huge sable chant. In addition, there was a sign posted that may have been a plant shown clearly on camera saying Sable 1, Vince McMahon 0. There were numerous close-ups on her with her waving to the camera for the remainder of the show. She was never identified as either Sable or Rena Mero. Eric Bischoff was the only one who really commented on her just noting that he's seen Playboy and making cryptic comments. Earlier in the week on the internet Bischoff tried to tease that she, alluding to a female with blonde hair in litigation against a wrestling promoter but never saying Sable or Rena Mero, was the driver of the Humvee that ran into Nash. However all WCW announcers were instructed to on television not even go so far as to tease that it may have been a woman driving the Humvee. After Sid Vicious did his run-in at the pay-per-view in Baltimore, Bischoff made it a point on Nitro the next night to say Sid wasn't the driver and that the driver appeared to have been a woman although never teasing anything on television that would lead viewers to believe he meant Mrs. Merrow. Other WCW personnel that evening were instructed not to reference Merrow by any name. WCW is trying to say that she bought a ticket to the show but her WWF contract specifically forbids making an appearance of this type on a WCW broadcast. The Maros were offered a contract release by WWF that would have allowed Mark to return to WCW immediately, but would not have allowed Rena to work for WCW until her contract expires in August 2001. In 1995 under similar circumstances, without any warning, Lex Luger, who had worked the previous night on a WWF house show in Canada, showed up for the inaugural edition of Nitro in Minneapolis. While Luger's contract had not expired, his attorney had found a contract breach, and he walked out with no notice in a major coup for getting Nitro off the ground and an embarrassment for WWF. McMahon threatened a lawsuit against Luger, but because of the breach, no lawsuit was ever filed. The game gets interesting on several accounts here, WWF and WCW both have lawsuits outstanding against one another. Mero has the much-publicized lawsuit against WCW. Perhaps the feeling in WCW is that WWF has so many legal problems at present. A third lawsuit filed over the past two weeks was by the Kuwaiti television announcer that was roughed up by Vader who this past week sued the WWF for $1.5 million. That they wouldn't want to add another one. However, not defending their contract sets a dangerous precedent on both sides unless there is some proof that there was a breach that makes Mero's situation different from usual protocol. If WWF doesn't do anything in such a highly publicized situation, it sets a precedent that talent can point to and leave the company while under contract and show up on the rival show, a game Eric Bischoff clearly loves to play. And games like that can go in both directions. What is to say that next week on Raw, that Bill Goldberg, in the midst of a contract dispute with WCW, or say any other wrestler wanting out of their deal, couldn't show up on Raw and have the WWF claim a precedent was set the previous week by the rival company? At one point last year when WWF was doing its unforgiven pay-per-view in Greensboro and Flair was on WCW hiatus and being sued by the company, there was talk of Flair showing up at the pay-per-view show, and it got serious enough that they had talked of pushing a Flair interview, and interviewing Reed Fleer. Eventually the WWF attorneys advised against the idea and Flair never attended the show. During the past week, the WWF sent a cease and desist to Rena Mero saying they had suspended usage of the name Sable, thus from this point forward she could no longer use the name. This was part of a negotiating ploy, mainly to impact the Playboy deal, which is really what started all this in the first place. However, over this past weekend, she was at an autograph session autographing the name Sable on the current TV Guide issue which she is on the cover and has a story about her departure from the WWF. Suspending the use of the name is part of the WWF's negotiations with Playboy over the issue proposed for August. WWF is attempting to get a fee from Playboy to allow them to use the name Sable in the August issue cover and centerfold shoot coming on the heels of the April issue that sold approximately 1 million copies. Where it gets interesting is that for that first issue, Mero turned down the magazine's initial deal despite it being encouraged by the WWF. Eventually, the WWF agreed to pay Sable a bonus above what the magazine was already paying her, and also not take a cut as it normally would as her agent for third-party promotions, to get her to do the original shoot as a promotion both for WrestleMania, and getting her over to where her value as a celebrity and to ratings increased from the exposure. The first cover sold so well that the magazine went to Sable, who was able to get approximately four times the money she earned on the first shoot, or a figure WWF believes to be $850,000, for the upcoming issue. 
The WWF was initially aware of the shoot and publicized it, but didn't know a money deal had been reached without going through them. WWF felt Sable's contract calls for the WWF to be her agent on such deals and wanted a cut, believing the first issue sold so well, with WWF not getting a cut, to a great part because WWF pushed the magazine so strongly on its television shows. In this week's TV Guide, Marrow's interview called the First Lady of the Ring by Janet Weeks, who as coincidence would have it in another lifetime I went to college with and we briefly worked at the same newspaper after each of us had graduated before I moved to Texas. The kind of story saw Sable fed softball questions and she answered them in a fashion that would make her look great to people, only see the surface part of the story. When asked about steroids and roid rage, she stated, I can't say for certain. But it's common knowledge that you do not look like the people in our sport without enhancement. The wrestlers of crew that we count on to set up the ring and the ramp a lot of them, I believe, may be on drugs. She talked about McMahon dropping the drug testing, while WWF attorneys claimed that WWF does drug test based on reasonable suspicion. She said she came to the decision to one out long before the death of Owen Hart and criticized the WWF for continuing the show after Hart died. When it was brought up that she posed topless for Playboy but the WWF was trying to get her to accidentally fall out of her top on Raw, she said, there is a time and place for that. I do not feel like in the middle of a wrestling arena where they're serving alcohol and there are screaming fans, including children, in the front row I don't feel like that is the proper place to be exposed. Posing for Playboy for me was a classy and tasteful thing to do. When asked what happened when she refused the accident, she said, anytime you refuse to do anything you are taken down a notch, and someone else is put up. It is total competition, 24 hours a day. Right after I told them I would not do that, it was scripted for me to lose my belt. If I would have agreed to do that, I would still be the WWF champion. WWF attorneys countered saying Sable losing the title was part of her planned storyline, indicating it didn't have to do with her refusing to bare her breasts. Since no date has been given for when Sable was requested to bare her breasts on Raw, I can't comment on this other than the die was cast for her to lose the title at Mania in January and wound up being delayed for various reasons and I'm assuming this request was after that point, although it may have also sped up existing plans, when asked about guys punching holes in the women's dressing room and if she complained about it, she said, every time that happened, we complained about it. We had several discussions with Vince McMahon to find out who was punching holes in walls to view us. One wrestler apologized. He felt so bad. But, I felt very uncomfortable and unsafe working there or even being backstage. It is such an obscene atmosphere. Women are having contests to see who has the largest nipples, they're pulling their skirts up to expose their private parts. The story also noted Marrow's current WWF contract was for a $150,000 guarantee which she noted was less than the men in the company. While nobody is specifically named in either the roid rage or threats made against her in the lawsuit, it is common belief when it comes to threats to disfigure her face or beat her up in the ring the alleged threats were made by Gertrude Vashon Heath, Luna. To say the WWF did nothing about it, if it was Mrs. Heath, would be incorrect being that she was fired shortly thereafter for those and other similar actions. The Great American Bash can be summed up in five words. This one was real bad. And it was desperation sinking into WCW as well. WCW now has a locker room which features Sid Vicious, who has walked out on every contract and every company he's been with for an entire career was the big surprise edition looked at as being Kevin Nash's next world title challenger. Can somebody say Ultimate Warrior? Not to mention he was let go from the company for a hotel brawl with Arn Anderson that he precipitated which wound up with both men seriously injured, and since that time his track record has been nearly flawless, in that he's walked out on every company he's worked for and set all-time records for no showing independent dates. For the record on that account, while it shows that Anderson and Ric Flair have absolutely no power in the organization, reports of Anderson okaying the deal are incorrect. The fact is that Anderson was never discussed with about the possibility of Sid coming in ahead of time and the only reason he knew before Sid arrived in Baltimore was because Randy Savage had told him. When Sid arrived Anderson was told that if he wanted to, he could have nothing to do with him. They're saying about that those who don't learn history, but in this case desperation takes precedence over lessons learned by history, and things are going to get worse before they get better. While there was a lot of opposition to Vicious being brought back after the way he exited five years ago, in the grand scheme of things, Morale is so bad this was considered just another day at the office. Actually, within WCW, there was more concern regarding the potential blow-up at some point with rapper Master P, figuring that when an incompetent promotion teams up with one of the wealthiest entertainers in the world that the resulting falling out is inevitable. Celebrity tie-ins have propelled companies to great heights in the past, 
and WCW did need new blood and a spark. So it's got a rap star in his entourage who will either be a success or failure within a few weeks, based on the gates at the New Orleans Superdome on June 21st and the Georgia Dome on July 5th if they can bring a new audience to the show. Master P did have a track record as a drawing card for some preseason NBA games with the Charlotte Hornets but he didn't seem to have that impressive a pop for his first two nights with WCW, and even company insiders after two nights were saying it was beginning to look like a failure. He may draw new fans to wrestling live, at least when he's a novelty, but it's doubtful he's going to help TV ratings because he's a major niche celebrity as opposed to a household name. If he was that big a ratings draw he'd be all over television helping shows that draw a lot higher ratings than WCW Nitro. The only thing where his regular appearances may mean something is that WCW gets destroyed in the teenage demographic by WWF, and his appeal will be largely with that teenage group where WCW needs help the most. Of course we had our Mike Tyson moment at his press conference held before Nitro the next night, which was embarrassing because it looked so clearly staged when you have members of the press clapping when P, who Bischoff tried to get over as a lifelong wrestling fan, and not some guy who has come into wrestling to collect a paycheck didn't even know the name of the guy he was doing his program with, Kurt Hennig, and referred to him as the cowboy guy. WCW also signed Dennis Rodman, who did spark the company to its second biggest money show in its history, but wound up getting half the profits, which means Vegas casinos and not WCW were ultimately the real money makers from last year's bash at the beach. And Sid is back, making Paul Heyman look even more desperate than even WCW coming out of that relationship than he did when he first cultivated it and saw him walk out on him twice before doing anything to help his future business. Of course, WWF was trying to get Master P as well and Eric Bischoff claimed on television that they, in the personage of Shane McMahon, offered him three times the money WCW was paying him. This isn't wrestling anymore, and it's not soap opera either. It's become kissing ass to celebrities and the game of who uses who when it's all over for publicity and who blames who when the management on both sides have their inevitable blow up. And when this round is over, the celebrities may realize that they were one year too late as this business is certainly no longer on the ascent. There is one huge difference between major celebrities and wrestlers that companies lose sight of. Wrestlers need wrestling not only for the job but for the ego recognition. Promoters know that and manipulate them, abuse them and underpay them accordingly. The few wrestlers around in a position of power because they don't need wrestling, and you know who they are, manipulate the system to where in many ways they do more harm than good to a profession that can't work at its most effective business-wise without nearly total control of its employees. When you incorporate people who absolutely don't need wrestling or give a rat's ass about it except what money they can take from it while doing little work in return, the promoters used to control are on foreign soil. If nothing else, this will be perversely entertaining to watch but two years from now won't be looked back at as a bright time in wrestling's history. The big show for WCW is not a pay-per-view, but the July 5th show at the Georgia Dome. If the combination of Master P and Dennis Rodman fails to sell a ton of tickets, and it may, or spark a sizable television rating, which it won't, the die will already be cast. WCW already destroyed all the marketability potential of Tank Abbott in two television appearances and appears to have already given up on him after giving him a three-year contract. Sid Vicious understands the business well enough that he won't be destroyed personally, but his track record shows it isn't like he's going to help the company in the long run either. And in two more months when this set of additions leaves and or fails, WCW will be in need of more fresh blood. Anybody know Jake Roberts' latest phone number? and they were forced to take their chances with this crew of reliable characters because the reliable characters they've had on their roster for years that led to one of the hottest periods for any company in history have been booked in such a creative manner over the past few months since Nash took over as Booker that not one of them means a thing today. The June 13th Great American Bash in Baltimore failed to sell out the arena, drawing 11,672, 8,740 paying $298,870, or about 1,400 shy of capacity on a traditional local major event that was also significantly papered. The tag team title change was good, and probably on another night after a better show would be considered real good, but the crowd was long gone by that point. Aside from that, all of WCW's problems were thrown out there in front of a largely indifferent audience. It should also be noted that the WWF sold out the Baltimore Arena for a house show on May 15, using a split crew with the top guys like Austin and Undertaker headlining in England and Rock, Big Show and Shamrock as the top draws. It opened with Master P and his No Limit soldiers coming out of a limo and meeting up with Kurt Hennig. Hennig got in their face but asked for an autograph. Master P, who evidently hasn't been watching Nitro, gave him an autograph CD. Hennig broke it in P's face. 
since there were about nine of them and one of him and he lived to tell about it without a scratch. Whatever perceived danger that gang could do in the fantasy world was ruined before their first real angle. The least there should have been was a zillion police officers stopping them and some less than veiled threats. Can you imagine in 1985 when Vince McMahon had Mr. T out there, if Roddy Piper had done something like that with nine of his friends backing him up, and all they did was start singing? 1. Hawk, James Fullington, pin Brian Nobbs, Brian Yandrasovitz, in a hardcore match in 541. Nobbs said to forget the weapons and just have a slugfest. Then when Hawk came out Nobbs hit him with a garbage can shot. Hawk pulled out a ladder and threw it on Nobbs. He put Nobbs' leg in between the ladder and started hitting the ladder with chair shots. Nobbs came back using the ladder. Hawk did a somersault off the top rope onto the ladder when Nobbs moved. Nobbs was giving Hawk a pounding until Hawk got the kendo stick and scored the pin after one shot to the head. After the match Hugh Morris ran out and he, Nobbs and Jimmy Hart gave Hawk a three-way pile driver and Morris moonsaulted the ladder with Hawk underneath and Nobbs came off the ropes with a garbage can splash onto the ladder with Hawk underneath. Hawk took a lot of punishment but it really wasn't much a match. One and a half stars. Two. Van Hammer, Mark Ty Hildreth, and Mikey Whipwreck, John Watson, in 835. This was one of those matches that people had decided was the worst match in history before the first lockup. It really wasn't that bad, but people at this point refused to accept people like this on pay-per-view shows and that isn't even speaking of ability since Whipwreck's first pay-per-view match for WCW was great, but more in the case of Hammer, a guy getting pushed for no reason other than the booking team has no clue and Whipwreck is a guy who isn't pushed as a star on television and thus nobody cares about him. And they had Juventud Guerrera and Billy Kidman at their disposal and couldn't figure out a way to work them into the show. Hammer delivered a superplex with a lot of hang time. He also climbed up the ring steps carrying Whipwreck and dropped him on the guard rail. Whipwreck tried a pescado which looked bad because Hammer was out of position to take it. Whipwreck got a near fall with a flying Thez press, but Hammer caught his second one and planted him with a sidewalk slam before using his Cobra clutch drop for the pin. Three quarters of a star. Three. Buff Bagwell, Marcus Bagwell, Pin Disco Inferno, Glenn Gilberti, in 1033. How's this for a trivia question Mike Tenney will never bring up? Who are the only mother and daughter, I mean mother and son combination who have both held the prestigious WCW World Tag Team titles? This was a decent match, but considering both these guys are in line for pushes, they should have had a better one. Bagwell has that almost anti-charisma for double nines as a babyface. That insincere Hogan-esque face that fans today hate being shoved down their throats because he's turned so many times they really just don't care. Disco used the stunner on the floor but Bagwell beat the 10 count barely. Bagwell blocked a Macarena pile driver, which was pretty funny, although it didn't seem like anyone in the crowd even remembered the Macarena, and came back and finally used a buff blockbuster that actually didn't look good for the pin. Two stars. 4. Conan, Charles Ashenoff, and Rey Mysterio Jr., Oscar Gutierrez, beat Kurt Hennig and Bobby Duncombe Jr. in 1044. Master P and his entourage came out to ringside for this. It's not even as if they try and disguise that an angle is coming and make it look the slightest bit not contrived with that angle at the beginning of the show, and the guys only coming out for this one match rather than being special guests who just happened to be there enjoying the show. Hennig's entrance music should head up most of the worst of lists but it's bound to become an all-time cult favorite and Hennig is going to become a cult babyface for his role in this feud if the powers that be don't see the future and cut him off ahead of time. Conan and Mysterio Jr. came out with gas masks on. Hennig must really be into this feud because his work is the best it's been in a long time. Master P hit Hennig early. Mysterio Jr. did some hot moves early until being caught and worked on for most of the match. This was an old-style match where they continually got heat on Mysterio Jr., and the ref kept missing his tags to Conan, so the heat built well. At least Master P was acting like he was into the match which added to the heat. Conan finally hot-tagged in, but Barry Windham came out of the crowd and KO'd him. Swole, Master P's bodyguard who wants to be a pro wrestler, which is where this connection really stems from who once played for the Edmonton Eskimos of the Canadian Football League, then knocked Duncombe Jr. down with a forearm and Mysterio Jr. pinned him. Security that got all of P's entourage out of there for interfering in the match, while allowing Hennig, Wyndham and Duncombe to destroy Conan and Mysterio Jr. in the ring after the match including Hog tying Mysterio Jr. The angle wasn't bad, but it wasn't anything that anyone remembered five minutes after it was over. Two and a quarter stars. Five. Ernest Miller pinned Horace Hogan, Mike Balia, in 5-10. A total waste of time. Scott Norton, who was scheduled for this match and also scheduled to do a job again in this match, didn't appear and no announcement was made as to why. 
The actual reason apparently is that the commission examined him and felt his blood pressure was dangerously high. Was that right after he was told to finish? Tony Shuvani and Bobby Heenan were talking about how all cats matches are brutal, which I'm assuming was meant to have a double meaning. Sonny Wanu put a red shoe on Miller's foot, oh no, the loaded ballet slipper, and he gave Hogan a sidekick for the pin. Negative one star. 6. Ric Flair, Richard Fleer, beat Roddy Piper, Roderick Toombs, via DQ in 816. This was the single worst pay-per-view match Flair has ever been in. So they are doing a match where the presidency of the company is at stake as a mid-card match? Christy Wolf in close-ups is the weirdest-looking female this side of Nicole Base. As bad as this was, it had by far the most heat of any match on the show. The fans were into every slow-mo classic spot. Piper's offense looked bad, which made Flair's selling of it look like a cartoon. Arn Anderson was helping Flair. Didn't Anderson get mad at Flair and try to help Chris Benoit on Nitro six days earlier? Flair walked around with his trunks down. Flair took a slam off the top. Piper got the sleeper but Flair got out. Anderson grabbed Piper's leg and Flair began working on it. Flair hit Piper with a foreign object but Piper kicked out. Flair had the figure four on and was holding Anderson's hand so Piper couldn't turn it when Bagwell did a run in decking Anderson and pounding on Flair. The ref DQ'd Piper for Bagwell helping out. Piper then decked Bagwell and with Flair and Anderson holding Bagwell down, Piper whipped him with a belt. Piper again whipped Bagwell with the belt after the match. I believe this was Piper's first heel turn since his face turn in 1986, and in a city like Baltimore, it was amazing to see just how little they cared about it. Dud. 7. Rick Steiner, Robert Reich Steiner, beat Sting, Steve Borden, in 1035 of a Falls Count Anywhere match. Another nothing match. These guys just have no chemistry against each other. Then again, they don't have any chemistry against anyone else, either. After Sting missed a stinger splash, Steiner undid the protective mats around ringside and then pile drove Sting right on a protective mat. Explain that one. Sting came back with two splashes off the middle rope and a nice splash off the top rope more than halfway across the ring. Sting used two stinger splashes into the corner and it was this point that pointed out loud and clear that WCW is really in trouble. Sting put on the scorpion and if you look back at the tape, you'll see every head in the building turn to the back. There was no run-in, but fans are conditioned to believe that every finish involves a run-in. This is what killed Crockett in 1987 to 1988 and that company was on fire in 1986. Steiner ended up getting a rope break although nobody in the building actually saw that. They ended up waltzing together to the back with the exception of Sting suplexing Steiner on the ramp. When they went backstage, the crowd was majorly poed and this killed the show. Backstage we saw Tank Abbott with a towel choking Sting when some dogs attacked Sting, with Scott back there as well. It was actually not Sting being attacked but actually the dog's trainer dressed up to look like Sting. The cameras quickly cut away. Rick and Scott came to the ring with ref Mickey J intimidating him and ordering him to raise Jay's hand saying Sting was pinned backstage. He did, and then Scott attacked him and threw him out of the ring. Scott grabbed the house mic and said WCW sucks. Nobody was arguing with him. Rick said that Baltimore was the shittiest town in America. I think he meant to say the bash was the shittiest show in America. At the end of the show a graphic read that no animals were harmed in the production of this show. What about all us humans who had to watch this? Negative one star. 8. Diamond Dallas Page, Page Falkenberg, and Chris Canyon, Chris Cluseritis, won the WCW tag titles from Chris Benoit and Perry Saturn, Perry Satullo, in 1913. There is actually a long involved story to this match. The June 7th match where Saturn replaced Flair and teamed with Benoit to beat Page and Bigelow to apparently win the tag titles was overruled. If you hadn't figured it out, Kevin Nash is only booking his own program and helping out one or two other programs even though he is head booker. Dusty Rhodes is now handling the lion's share of the booking of the rest of the wrestlers including this program. So Dusty wanted to do the send people home thinking title change but then tell them on television, under on Thursday, that it didn't really happen. Thursday was supposed to be Flair vs. Benoit in a grudge lumberjack match. However, WCW forgot to tell Flair he was booked, and it was so incredibly stupid because Jason Hervey was in Charlotte at the request of management and they gave Flair off thunder because they were producing an upcoming Flair home video for Trimark, but never informed the people writing the show about Flair having the day off, or some sort of typical miscommunication. Anyway, when they panicked since Flair wasn't there at 6pm, they called him and told him to get to Syracuse. At a cost of thousands of dollars, by the way in the money-wasting department this was a mere pittance as compared to the dollar 100,000 plus, 
and not $50,000 as listed last week for that skit where they destroy the limo on Nitro for a 2.7 quarter. They chartered a flight from Charlotte to Syracuse to get Flair to Thunder, but due to a weather problems, it couldn't get off the ground until 7 p.m. The show was put together with the idea Flair would do several interviews building to the Benoit match and it was supposed to be a show built around Flair vs. Benoit. So virtually the entire Thunder show was filling time. Flair finally arrived at 9.55 p.m., but they had already changed plans for the show because they had to be off the air at 10.03 p.m. because TBS decreed that the chimp movie had to start on time. So as a panic move, the decision was made to turn the Saturn Canyon singles match and build it into a tag title match. However, Bam Bam Bigelow wasn't there either because he was hospitalized with a back problem, which is why he was at ringside but did little and didn't work this match, so Canyon defended the title with Paige with zero explanation given to have this make sense and in fact it wasn't even announced as a title match until about a minute left in the match. The title change to Benoit and Saturn was planned all along for this pay-per-view, with it going back on the next pay-per-view, but they needed something for Thunder so moved the storylines ahead with the tag title change to Benoit and Saturn on Thunder, and the change back on this show. Oh and when Flair got there, rather than do his match with Benoit for next week's Thunder, or have him do an interview or dark match for the live crowd, since they didn't want him on next week's Thunder in an interview because it would have given away the pay-per-view result with him still as president. They just told Flair when he got there that he wasn't needed and he may have gone right back home. Anyway, this was a good match but had little heat because the fans were still mad about the previous finish. Benoit and Paige were real good and Canyon did well. Saturn had his ups and downs and some of his stuff was off and other stuff was very good. Canyon's best innovative move was a rocker dropper off the middle rope. Canyon missed a moonsault allowing Benoit to hot tag Saturn, which got a surprisingly little pop. Saturn splashed on Paige for a near fall. Eventually they took over on Saturn as well for several minutes. There wasn't much of a crowd pop for Benoit's hot tag either which was a surprise because you'd think aside from Flair, that Benoit would be the hottest wrestler in Baltimore. Canyon crashed into Bigelow allowing Benoit to deliver three rolling German suplexes on him but Paige saved the pin. Benoit got a great near fall with a dragon suplex. Benoit went off the top rope with a diving headbutt, but at the same time Saturn came off the top and Paige caught him with a diamond cutter. Saturn was outside the ring and Dean Malenko came out. Apparently Malenko was trying to help Saturn up but ref Johnny Boone was distracted. It wasn't clear if Malenko was trying to keep Saturn out of the ring or help him. In the ring, Bigelow and Page did a double-team diamond cutter on Benoit and Page put Canyon on top for the pin. In the ring, they attacked Malenko after the match with a double-team diamond cutter on a tag title belt on him as well. Three and a quarter stars. Nine. Kevin Nash retained the WCW title beating Randy Savage via DQ in 729. Nash was selling the ribs a little. He started out strong but Savage and Medusa kicked his ribs to slow him down and Miss Madness, who it is clear is the most valuable member of the entourage as far as getting through a match because she does the high spots for Savage who is so heavy and limited from a mobility standpoint due to injuries and age that he can't work anymore. Savage hit the elbow but Nash kicked out. Nash came back with snake eyes, a high kick and a power bomb when Medusa interfered kicking Nash for the DQ. Nash slammed Miss Madness off the top rope and threw Gorgeous George in a skimpy top over his back. She covered up quickly while the WCW camera crew made sure to avoid the accidental shot of her boobs popping out. He delivered the snake eyes on Miss Madness when Sid ran in with a high kick and power bomb, leaving Nash laying. Savage looked totally out of it leaving the ring. He was bleeding from the mouth and his eyes looked to be somewhere else and needing help to get to the back. This didn't appear to be a sell although he wasn't seriously injured either, since Nash had done nothing to him. Not in the Hogan Warrior League, but under any normal standard, a completely horrible main event. Negative one star. The June 14th Raw is War Show drew what should be labeled the most impressive rating in the history of the show. While on paper it was the fourth highest rated Raw ever, the 6.66 rating, 6.52 first hour, 6.79 seconds hour, and 10.7 share was more impressive than previous high water marks. The record-setting 8.19 was done on an unopposed week. The 7.14 on May 24 was caused by extenuating circumstances coming the day after the death of Owen Hart. The May 31st show still probably was helped by the residual curiosity stemming from the death of Hart, while the June 7th show which drew a nearly identical 6.68 was the answer to the high-power cliffhanger. Nitro in opposition drew a 3.26 rating, 3.71 first hour, 2.85 seconds hour, 3.22 third hour, and a 5.3 share. Over the head-to-head -head 2 hours and 5 minutes Nitro drew a 3.04 rating. 
Raw doubled the viewership of Nitro in every competitive quarter but not in the overrun. In main event comparisons the Raw main event of Undertaker vs. Rock vs. Triple H drew a 6.78 final quarter and a 6.82 overrun. WCW's very brief Nash vs. Savage main event drew a 3.79 rating for a one-minute match which was also the only point in the show that Sid Vicious appeared so his TV debut was the highest rated segment of the two hours. The high point for Raw was the fifth quarter with X-Pac vs. Big Show and Jarrett vs. Shamrock doing a 7.12, barely beating out the quarter with Deborah vs. Ivory and Test Blindfolded vs. Bossman which did a 7.01. The 7.12 destroyed the 3.05 rating for a hype star power match with Flair and Piper and Page and Canyon vs. Benoit and Malenko and Bagwell and Saturn. The earlier Flair Piper interview segment opening the head to head portion also only did a 3.0, showing as we've been writing for weeks that Flair would not maintain his ratings power as a heel. The fact that this was Piper's first week as a heel in 13 years and it meant absolutely nothing is a telling sign and not a good one at that. As far as the celebrity factor with Master P, the quarter hour featuring him in the Conan and Mysterio Jr. vs. Psychosis and La Parka match did a 3.23 largely going up against a Vince and Shane interview on Raw. In other ratings for the week, Sunday Night Heat drew a strong 4.24 rating and 8.4 share, Livewire did a 1.7 and Superstars did its best mark in years with a 2.5. For WCW, WCW Saturday Night did a 1.7 while Thunder did a 3.07 rating. The Thunder ratings are interesting to compare because it takes the WWF factor out of the equation as to where WCW is losing in popularity. As compared to the first quarter, January through March of this year only three months ago, WCW has dropped 33% among kids under 12, 34% among teenagers 15% among adult males while dropping 9% among adult females. Considering we are talking about such a short period of time, WCW's faltering among kids is nothing short of staggering. The TNT movie Assault on Death Mountain starring Hulk Hogan drew a 2.09 rating for its premiere on June 8th in the 8 to 10 p.m. time slot. This is roughly half of the 4.2 rating that the previous Assault on Devil's Island movie did on October 28, 1997, which is a combination of several factors. First off that movie's rating was greatly helped by sizable promotion to the wrestling audience, including doing an angle where the Hogan Sting contract signing took place during the movie. While there was substantial promotion during Nitro for the second movie, there was no major wrestling angle held. Just as important is it shows how Hogan's drawing power as a television star has changed over the past 19 months. Hogan was unable to pull the core wrestling audience that watches Nitro to see him in a movie this time out, as the Nitro demographic younger audience was not there, 89% of the audience was adults as compared to 75% for Nitro and 61% for Raw. Network competition was considered weak and the movie was still the second highest rated show on cable trailing Brady Bunch repeats on Nick at Night that did a 2.4 repeated showings of the movie drew 1.4 and 0.7 ratings. UFC over the past week has officially adopted a new rulebook and also at this point is going ahead with the Marco Ruiz vs. Maurice Smith main event on the July 16th pay-per-view show from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The show is the most important in the recent history of UFC because the Nevada State Athletic Commission will be at the show reviewing UFC leading to an expected hearing within a few weeks. While there is no guarantee a positive review by the commission and UFC running shows in Las Vegas will result in a turnaround when it comes to UFC within the pay-per-view industry, particularly Time Warner Cable, Cablevision and TCI, which basically crippled the event by refusing to air it. Acceptance in Nevada has been considered by many almost a do or die for at least the possibility of a turnaround existing. Smith lost via technical knockout to Peter Ertz in the main event of K1's June 6 show in Sapporo, 40 days before the UFC event. UFC has always claimed to have protective standards for fighters equal to or greater to that of pro boxing, which in most commission states suspends the license of a fighter for 90 days following a knockout. That law has loopholes because if a boxer were to be knocked out in a foreign country or in a non-commission match, it doesn't always count regarding the suspension although it should. That was a kickboxer here in California, who after being knocked out in a sanctioned fight, was knocked out a second time a few weeks later in an unsanctioned fight on an Indian reservation, although the same commission members were there viewing that fight, and was then allowed to fight on a Draca show in Los Angeles at the forum after 90 days were up from the first knockout. He was knocked out a third time, and died, Although the timing of the loophole as it regarded the safety issue in that death was never a public issue, we have yet to see the smith Ertz finish, but descriptions from a variety of sources indicate it was a series of punches with Smith in a lot of trouble, when Smith's manager, Kirk Jensen, threw in the towel. 
Jensen said that Smith would be fine in 40 days to fight in UFC. At one point UFC did have a rule that fighters wouldn't be used for 90 days after a knockout, but the latest rulebook is more vague regarding a time limit, simply stating that the president has the authority to suspend an athlete who has been injured in competition for 30 to 90 days. It appears that matchmaker John Peretti wants to keep the Smith vs. Ruiz match, and at this stage of the game, it would be difficult to find a main event caliber opponent, although with Randy Couture splitting from the Raw team after the contractual dispute that left him out of the last rings show, and with the Raw team being at odds with UFC being the reason Couture never came back to defend his title, who as a former champion could be a possibility that would both agree to face Ruiz, and that Ruiz would agree to face. Smith would still have to get a medical clearance to fight before the show and be approved by the Iowa Athletic Commission. My feeling is this decision has little in the way of upside, aside from some inconvenience, and a lot of downside. If Smith were to be injured by Ruiz, which the odds are against it happening but you never know what's going to happen in a shoot, his being allowed to fight would be a strike held against UFC at a time they can't afford one. The upside just isn't strong enough. It isn't as if Smith vs. Ruiz is any kind of a marquee matchup. It's the weakest main event in the history of the company to begin with. Ruiz, who is in his early 40s, hasn't fought in UFC since 1995 and is coming off a loss to pro wrestler Alexander Otska in his most recent match. Smith, who is 38, whose main claim to fame was outlasting Mark Coleman in 1997 and winning perhaps the most memorable UFC title match in history, lost handily to Kevin Randleman in his last UFC match and has had two losses in his last two K1 matches as well. It isn't as if this match is going to spark any kind of buy rate and a change will hurt business, other than having to make advertising changes. The odds are in favor that Smith probably won't be hurt badly against Ruiz but whenever the odds are in favor of UFC they usually still lose, but with a show in Las Vegas and the future at stake, this is not a gamble worth taking. Largely stemming from what most feel was a bad decision in the May 15th Boss Rutan vs. Randleman World Heavyweight title match where Rutan won the decision despite suffering a broken nose and numerous facial cuts and being taken down five times by the former two-time NCAA champion. Although those defending Rutan can point out he threw more than twice as many blows during the fight and was busier on his back in the second half than Randleman was while holding him down, a new 16-page UFC rulebook was completed this past week by MAC President Jeff Blatnick. The rules regarding drug testing, UFC doesn't test for steroids but does test for many drugs, mainly the likes of cocaine and amphetamines, are that a refusal to take the drug test would be considered a positive test and result in a 90 suspension and a loss of purse for the fight. A positive test results in the fighter being disqualified in his fight if he had won it, his purse withheld and he will be suspended. 25% of the purse being withheld goes to his opponent and the fighter must test clean before being allowed to participate again. This isn't to say UFC has never had designated pissers either. The judging criteria has been specified from the more vague grappling and striking superiority to clean strikes, effective grappling, octagon control and effective aggressiveness. It specifies damage done on strikes as opposed to total number of strikes, and that strikes thrown from the top should be generally considered more effective than those thrown from the bottom, specifically rules inspired by Rutan Randleman were Rutan threw more than twice as many strikes but almost all were from the bottom with less leverage. They also specify that if fighters are in a guard position an entire round with neither having the edge in clean strikes, then the fighter who scored the takedown should win the round, which is a specific way of saying that takedowns count. There has been considerable debate since that fight as to whether takedowns in and of themselves, without follow-up damage, should be taken into effect when scoring an MMA fight. Wrestling people, since takedowns are the key element in their sport, argue in favor of takedowns while many in the Valley Tudo world believe takedown without follow-up blows thrown while in control, particularly a takedown, where the bottom guy controls the top guy in the guard, mean nothing in the course of a fight. The octagon control criterion is another in that direction, as for Rutan Randleman, since the fight was fought on the ground and Randleman put him there, he had control of how and where the fight was fought. There is a strong argument that the minor changes in the rules do favor wrestlers in a close fight if the wrestlers can take their opponent down and control them there without inflicting a lot of damage to them. The scoring system is defined even more technically, basically that if it's a striking match on the feet, then the number one criterion should be striking effectiveness. If the match is mainly on the ground, the number one criterion should be grappling effectiveness. If the match is 50-50 standing and on the ground and striking and grappling are also both even, then the octagon control factor should be brought into play, and then overall aggressiveness thrown in as the final factor. Officially starting with this show, UFC matches will be fought with rounds. Championship matches will be 5 5-minute five rounds while non-title matches will be 3 5-minute rounds.
dark matches off television preliminary matches, so to speak, would be two rounds. There will no longer be overtime periods. There will be no more stand-ups if the action is at a stalemate going nowhere on the ground. I don't have a problem one way or the other when it comes to rounds. It's a good decision in that if it looks more like boxing, it's just another thing critics can't criticize and is more adaptable to rules and commission states. Having seen fights with stand-up and without stand-up rules, the fights with stand-ups are far more entertaining and ultimately with no benefit of media hype like boxing, entertainment is of prime importance. The problem is in UFC where John McCarthy can be fairly criticized is he's been inconsistent in regard to application of the stand-up rule, which may have on one or two occasions changed eventual outcomes of fights, and eliminating the rule eliminates the inconsistency. The only problem is, having seen so many dreadful pride and even extreme fighting matches without stand-ups, that would I when played before an American audience with a short attention span, I think precautions when it comes to stalling are necessary in this sport because it has evolved to where stalemates exist. UFC has had its boring fights, but the idea of three or even worse five straight five-minute rounds stalemated in the guard with no stand-ups until the round ends makes for scary television even if purists would argue it contaminates the reality of the fight. Fact is, this isn't and never was a real fight. It is a sport with rules that has to be both television viewer and commission friendly for a chance at survival. Matches will be scored on boxing's 10-point must system where the winner of the round gets 10 points and an even round becomes 10 to 10. Judges are allowed to judge rounds evenly and matches can be draws. The old criteria was simply for judges to vote on who they thought won the fight and judges were not allowed to pick draws. A round 1 would be 10-9 and total domination would be 10-8. Fouls will be assessed one point penalty and a $500 fine, which goes to the opponent. Three fouls would be a disqualification and an additional $1,000 fine. My feeling on the scoring, having judged fights before, is that by trying to alleviate what many feel, although many thought it was a good decision as well as this wasn't a Holyfield Lewis deal where there was probably an element of fixing involved, was a bad decision in the Randleman Rutten match. And some feel the same for the Coleman Rizzo fight, which was, in my opinion, a lot closer. They've tried to copy boxing rules. The problem is having watched many boxing events that boxing with those rules has far more bad decisions by percentage than UFC has ever had. Sometimes putting numbers to paper doesn't give you the right winner that simply picking a winner would give you. The rules have been put in effect because of the belief that judges are naturally swayed toward putting more emphasis on the closing minutes than the opening minutes in a fight and the famed last impression on the judges, and using rounds and a point system to a degree will remove some of that emphasis. But I'm still looking at practical application. I've seen and worked with the UFC system which has had a few close fights that I disagree with but can accept the verdict and one which I disagreed with fairly strongly, and still do after watching a tape of it, but many people whose opinions I respect thought it was a good decision. In boxing, I've seen some ridiculous decisions and even some decisions that in the end turned out okay. De La Hoya vs. Quarty for example. But the judges' cards for that fight were scary and that if Quarty had deserved to win, he was still going to lose. In another key ruling, no fighter can hold two title matches at the same time. In other words, if Boss Rutten goes after the middleweight title, as he has expressed interest in doing, by doing so, he automatically would vacate the heavyweight title. While none of this has officially happened, the prevailing belief seems to be right now that Frank Shamrock will be stripped of the middleweight title unless he signs a contract to face Tito Ortiz, which at this point isn't expected to happen because Shamrock won't agree to the exclusivity clause that wouldn't allow him to fight in Japan. Rutten would probably face Ortiz to determine the vacant middleweight title while the heavyweight title, that Rutten would vacate, would be up in a match involving Randleman, Pedro Rizzo and Pete Williams, all of which is expected to go down between September and December. USC moved its September 17th date to September 24th due to September 17th being the same weekend as Oscar de la Hoya vs. Felix Trinidad. They also have a show still scheduled for October 31st and a December date. Without question the most famous teacher in the history of Lucha Libre, Diablo Velasco of Guadalajara, passed away on June 13 in his hometown, after a lengthy undisclosed illness at the age of 75. Velasco, whose protégés including the greatest legends in Mexican history including El Santo, Blue Demon, Pero Abueyo, Rayo de Jalisco Sr. and Cabernario Galindo, was rated as one of the ten most important figures in the history of Lucha Libre, had trained many of the most famous luchadores of the past several generations over the span of 55 years. His funeral was held on June 14 and EMLL released all its wrestlers and office staff to attend the funeral. EMLL had already planned a 40th anniversary show for Arena Coliseo in Guadalajara on June 20, and will be honoring Velasco at the show. Born Cuauhtémoc Velasco, 
He began wrestling in the early 1940s and was a relatively anonymous wrestler. The list of wrestlers that he trained that reached stardom is believed to be the most of any wrestler trainer of any form of pro wrestling in history. Among the biggest names included Alfonso Dantes, Apollo Dantes, Cesar Dantes, Ringo Mendoza, Casho Mendoza, Irma Aguilar, Irma Gonzalez, Emilio Charles Jr. and Sr., Dandy El Satanico, Angel Blanco Sr. and Jr., Cien Caras Mascara Ano 2000, Universo 2000, Javier Cruz, Tarzan Lopez, Grand Marcus Jr., Bestia Salvaje, Corazon Salvaje, Mosco de la Merced, Zorro, Solar 1 and 2, Mr. Aguila, Atlantis, Rivera Jalisco Jr., Pero Agueo Jr., Archangel, and Shocker. Shocker was his final big-name protege of his Guadalajara wrestling school. He'd retired from training due to a terminal illness in 1997. <laughs> Japanese Television Rundown May 22nd Rings 1. Yasuhito Namikawa beat Sarah Umar in 309 of a shoot match. Umar was short and didn't have much of a physique as he weighed 189 with thin arms and legs and a nice-sized belly. Talk about not telling the book from the cover and he was aggressive and gave Namakawa trouble standing with his aggressiveness. They were popping each other standing. Umar was cut under his left eye in the first minute. Umar was hitting Namakawa more than he liked so Namakawa shot and Umar blocked it at first. Finally Namakawa got him on the ground and got his back for the choke. A surprisingly real good match. 2. Valentijan Overeem beat Hiromi Sukaneara in another shoot match. Overeem nailed Kaneara with kicks and knees and put him down in 39 seconds. He went for the kill but Kaneara managed to take him down and basically dislocate his knee but with Overeem on the ropes he got the break. Overeem screamed out and it looked like the match was over, but they managed to put it back in place, and after him squatting on it, begged to continue. I think the doctor had decided to stop the match and Overeem had to talk him out of it saying his knee was okay. Akira Maeda seemed to overrule the first stoppage and order the match to continue. The match was tremendous. Overeem nearly ended it with a high kick that barely missed. Overeem knocked the wind out of Kaneara with a body kick but Kaneara had enough presence to take him down but Overeem was so quick he got a front guillotine for another rope break. Overeem got a knee to the chin, but Kaneara took him down again and again got guillotined. By this point it was 6-0 with only 350 gone. Overeem then knocked Kaneara out with a high kick to the back of the head. 3. Fulton beat Masayuki Naruse in a worked match in 746 by reversing a guillotine into an armbar for the tap out. Naruse was leading 4 to 2 at the time. Decent match with the finish real good. The highlight was Naruse knocking Han down with a hard slap which looked great live, although the replay clearly showed Han overselling it. 2 and a quarter stars, 4. Eliakine Mikhail beat Yope Castell with an ankle lock in 940. This was a worked match but because of the size difference, it looked pretty bad as Castell is probably 11 inches taller and 63 pounds heavier. Mikhail scored the first 3 pounds on rope breaks. Castell then got 2 knockdowns to go ahead 4-3. to three. They were trading points before the finish. 1 and a quarter stars. 5. Yoshihisa Yamamoto beat Tsuyashi Kosaka in a worked match in 1541. Yamamoto needed the win since they are building him up for the match in August against Naoya Ogawa. Even though it was worked, Kosaka looked off just a bit even though this ended up being the best match on the card. Kosaka took real poundings in losing to Boss Rudin and Gilbert Evel in his last two shoot matches. Really good mat work. Kosaka scored the first point at 640 with an ankle lock but Yamamoto rolled to the ropes. Kosaka legitimately tired out and when they had the great slugfest spot, you could see Kosaka tiring so his offense didn't look as good as it should have. Toward the end Kosaka got a flying arm bar, and later Yamamoto got an armbar and Kosaka did a great reversal into a choke. Finally, Yamamoto knocked him out with a series of open hands. Three and a half stars. 6. Kiyoshi Tamura won the ring's world heavyweight title from Bitsaid Teriel in a worked match. Teriel weighed 326 and Tamura weighed 193 so you can imagine how that looked. Still, it was a pretty good match. It wasn't as good as their first match in 1997 which was a classic, but was a ton better than their second match in 1998. They were trading points with the idea that bigger Teriel was killing him standing but Tamura was quicker once they got on the ground. Teriel scored a knockdown but Tamura came back with two chokes they were tied 2-2 two two at 5.45. Tamura got another rope break after a takedown before finally getting the choke in the middle in 9.19. Three and a quarter stars. May 30th All Japan. This was a different type show as they just aired clips of a lot of different matches over the past month. 
It opened with Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Amori getting the push as a new contending tag team beating Mitsuharu Masawa and Masahito Kakihara from Karaku and Hall with Amori pinned Kakihara after an axe bomber, a funky Hogan slash Davy Boy Smith style clothesline. They show the last 3.30 and there was a lot of heat and it seemed to be a real good match, largely due to Kakihara. Takayama was still terrible, but since he and Kakihara have worked against each other for so many years, Kakihara could carry him through and Misawa could carry him as well. Then they aired Kenna Kobashi and Jun Akiyama over Wolf Hockfield and Johnny Ace from Karakuen Hall. Akiyama power bombed Hockfield off the middle ropes and pinned him with an exploder. Again, only 3.30 aired. Akiyama and Ace brawled after the match after Akiyama had jumped Bart Gun and they set up a tag team title feud in Akiyama Ace program. What aired also had really good heat. Then they showed brief clips of all Japan wrestlers in FMW rings, with Takeshi Morishima beating Yoshinori Sasaki and Tsuyashi Kikuchi beating Koji Nakagawa. This led to airing clips of a six man from the Tokyo Dome with Masa Fuchi and Johnny Smith and Taman Honda beating FMW's team of Nakagawa and Ghetto and Yukihiro Kanemura. Based on what aired, this looked only fair except Smith looked good. Then they showed dome clips of Morishima and Satoru Asako beating Yoshinobu Kanemaru and Kentaro Shiga from Karaku and Hall when Asako used his super driver on Kanemaru which from the clips seemed good. Finally they had clips of Kikuchi and Masamichi Marufuji beating Grand Naniwa and Makoto Hashi from the Tokyo Dome. Marufuji is the best of the new All Japan wrestlers, as he's very reminiscent of Misawa at the same stage of his career, and looked real good in the clips shown, including delivering a shooting star press. Television Ratings Rundown The latest update on all WWF and WCW performers that have appeared as a main focal point of a competitive segment at least seven times in 1999. A competitive segment consists of a quarter hour or competitive total runover period after 9.15 p.m. on Monday nights when both shows are on simultaneously. Ranked by quarter hour percentage increase or decrease. A plus 1.00 average rating means that on average when this performer is featured on a segment, the audience increases by 0.1 ratings points or about 75,650 homes or about 113,500 viewers. Updated as of June 7th. The May 24th television show, due to the unique circumstances regarding the show, is not included in the averages. A plus 5.33 rating means on average a quarter hour this performer was on an increased viewership by an average of 605,000. A minus 3.00 rating means an average appearance by this performer decreased viewership by 340,500. Mexico, there is a lot of heat regarding the mafia syndicate angle involving Los Hermanos Dinamita and Kurgan. The Dynamitas are now called El Hombre and Negro, and come to the ring in a long black raincoat. Kurgan wears a black duster of the same style as the Columbine High School Killers, and it's said to be too exact to be a coincidence. They don't specifically push it's the same style clothes as the killers on television, but the message isn't lost on the fans which makes it one of the more revolting promotional stunts in a year that unfortunately will be more remembered for that category than for great matches. The biggest match of the past week was June 13th at Arena Coliseo, where Atlantis retained his CMLL light heavyweight title pinning Villano Tercero in about 20 minutes, with a small package in the third fall. The two men issued mask versus mask challenges after the match, but no such match was announced. It was mostly mat work but reported in the press as being a good match. Villano 4 who has been out of action for several months after neck surgery stemming from the WCW match where a double-team move from Raven and Canyon was mistimed, was in V3's corner which I believe is the first time he's been involved as a performer on a wrestling show since the surgery. He's supposed to return to the ring fairly soon. They did a big angle on the June 11th television show. Kurgan Apollo Dantes, Cien Caris and the Masked Men in Black, rumored to be Pierroth Jr. although he's been in Puerto Rico the last several months, all attacked Ryo de Jalisco Jr., who was sitting in the stands at ringside and cut off his trademark ponytail that hangs below his mask. The EMLL TV taping lightning match gimmick is getting a little too predictable. Compared to American television, the EMLL matches with their three falls, mostly trios matches and usually going 15 to 25 minutes are slow paced and with WWF on TV in Mexico, EMLL has one lightning match, which is a one fall singles match with a 10 minute time limit. The problem is, they've now done them 11 straight weeks on Friday nights, and in all 11 matches, the Tecnico, Babyface, has won. Los Super Payasos beat Los Oficiales to win the DF Trio's title on June 13th and now call upon via DQ for refusing to stop pounding in Los Payasos. Titles change hands in Mexico and in most Japanese offices on a DQ. 
All Japan. Most of the reports on the Mitsuharu Misawa vs. Kena Kobashi Triple Crown match on June 11th at Budokan Hall before a packed house of 16,300 fans indicate it was the best match of the year, which this year there is shockingly little competition for that award. I can't think of one US match that would even be in the running as the best ones are Austin vs. Rock for April and Juventud Guerrero vs. Blitzkrieg and both fell way short so I guess the best ones would be Misawa vs. Kaoda. Liger vs. Kanemoto and the best I've seen up to this point was the Kobashi and Akiyama vs. Misawa and Ogawa match from Budokan Hall. Misawa won in 43-40, marking the fifth time the two had met for the Triple Crown, all Misawa wins and all going more than 35 minutes. They had a special 45-minute television show on June 13th so most of the match aired on television. There was probably a lot of speculation going in that Kobashi would win, because at one point Misawa wanted the belt on Kobashi feeling that it would be better for the company to have the guy known as company president not have the triple crown. Fueling that even more was that Kobashi and Jun Akiyama lost the double tag titles on June 9th in Sendai before a sellout 3,550 to Johnny Ace and Bart Gunn and usually a big loss precedes a big win. The finish of that match was at 1936 when Ace pinned Akiyama with the Cobra Clutch Suplex. Misawa vs. Kobashi must have been brutal, because at this stage of the game as beat up as Misawa is, to do a match of that quality is kind of scary. Kobashi suffered a broken nose and will require surgery on June 16th, and will be out of action for a month after that which means he'll miss most of the next tour and may not be back until the July 23rd Budokan Hall show. Misawa was so banged up that for the first time ever reporters were told that he couldn't see them after the match. Reporters were waiting for 30 minutes when finally they were told Misawa wouldn't be able to talk. The match featured a ton of near falls, finishing with a move called the Emerald Erosion, which is a side pile driver similar to the move Tommy Dreamer has used called the Dreamer Driver. Misawa actually invented the move in January 1998 using it to beat Akiyama. There were three other major matches on the show. Vader pinned Gun in 637 after a power bomb. The two shook hands after the match. Gun gained an early advantage throwing punches as All Japan recognizes Gun as a hard puncher from his WWF brawl for all rep. Akiyama pinned Johnny Ace in 320 with a Hurricane Rana in Akiyama's payback win for doing the job in the tag title change. Clearly they kept those matches short because they were going so long for the main event. It was probably a good idea to deliver a very short match with name wrestlers since fans have been conditioned not to believe anything is the finish until the 15 minutes mark so it's difficult for the big Budokan matches to get heat until that call. In a big upset, all Asian tag team champions Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Amori beat former double champs Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Tawe in 1606 when Takayama pinned Tawe for the first time using a leg drop. The other two major matches on the Sendai show saw Yoshinari Ogawa retain the PWF junior title pinning Kentaro Shiga in 2031 after a back suplex, and Misawa and Jinsei Shinzaki beat Vader and Monokia Mossman in 1521 when Misawa pinned Mossman. The July 23rd Budokan Hall double main event will be Misawa vs. Kaoda for the Triple Crown and Ace, and Gun defending the tag titles against Takayama and Mori. Next tour starts July 4th and will have Vader, Gary Albright, Ace, Gun, Johnny Smith and Carl Ulit who will go under the name Pierre Ulit as the foreigners. Misawa Kobashi, Tawe and Kaoda are now teaching at the Human Academy Sports College in Tokyo as a joint venture to help publicize all Japan. They are teaching classes in training and dietary tips for professional athletes. June 6 TV show which was the Misawa and Tawe vs. Kobashi and Kawada match drew a 5.4 rating which is excellent for the slot. New Japan This year's G1 Climax Tournament, which is usually the in-ring highlight of the wrestling year will be August 10th and August 11th at Osaka Furitsu Gym and August 13th to August 15th at Sumo Hall. Generally speaking, the August G1 Sumo Hall shows are usually the best in ring wrestling shows of the year. This year's tournament will be two blocks of six wrestlers, similar to the recently concluded Super Junior Tournament, where everyone wrestles everyone in singles matches over the five dates which means there will be six tournament singles matches on every show except the final night which should have seven or more tournament matches. On the August 15th show, after the round robin ends, the two wrestlers from each group with the best record two points for a win, one for a 30 minutes draw, will meet in the finals. The A block has Tadao Yasuda, Satoshi Kojima, Yuji Nagata, Kensuke Sasaki, Keiji Muto, and Tatsumi Fujinami. The B block has Manabu Nakanishi, Hiroyoshi Tenzan, Kazuo Yamazaki, who actually will be returning from his injury in only a few weeks after at first being expected out for the rest of the year, Shiro Koshinaka, Shinya Hashimoto, and Masahiro Chono. 
in the magazines, they are really pushing a great Muda vs. Great Nita match, which may take place at either the new Saibu Dome or a Tokyo Dome show later this year. There has been very little talk about interpromotional matches after Muto and Seiji Sakaguchi appeared on the All Japan TV show and after Misawa appeared on a TV Asahi fighting sports talk show. Next tour opens June 25th. The major shows are June 27th in Shizuoka headlined by Sasaki and Koshinaka defending the IWGP tag titles against Tatsutoshi Goto and Mishiyoshi Ohara, Koji Kanemoto defends the IWGP junior title against Minoru Tanaka, Jushin Liger and El Samurai and Dr. Wagner Jr. vs. Shinjiro Atani and Tatsuhito Takaiwa and Kendo Kashin, Yasuda and Meng vs. Scott Norton and Tenzan, Hashimoto and Nakanishi vs. Fujinami and Nagata and Mudo and Kojima vs. Chono and Michael Wall Street. July 1st in Gifu has Hashimoto and Nagata and Yasuda and Meng vs. Mudo and Norton and Tenzan and Kojima, Liger and Wagner Jr. vs. Atani and Takaiwa and Kanemoto vs. El Samurai. The two major shows are July 20th and July 21st at Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center which will be the final New Japan shows in that building before it gets torn down. On July 20th it'll be Muto vs. Kojima for the IWGP heavyweight title which is the big match on the tour, Genichiro Tenryu and Fujinami vs. Norton and Tenzan, Sasaki and Koshinaka vs. NWO Sting and Chono, Hashimoto and Nagata vs. Mang and Nakanishi, Liger and Samurai and Wagner Jr. vs. Kanemoto and Atani and Kashin. The July 21st show will be Chono at NWO Sting vs. Muto and Tenzan, Fujinami and Nakanishi and Yasuda vs. Sasaki and Koshinaka and Junji Hirata Hashimoto vs. Wall Street, Tenryu and Mang Sumo Wrestlers Tag Team vs. Kojima and Norton Yamazaki returns against Nagata and a junior heavyweight battle royal. It's really strange to see the big show as far as matches be on the first night instead of the second night. Don Fry and Brian Johnson have the tour off. The June 12th television show was preempted. Other Japan notes. Antonio Inoki is now talking about promoting a big show late this year at the Tokyo Dome. This is in the very preliminary talking stages and nowhere close to reality. His idea is for it to be a joint show with UFO, Pride and Rings and among his ideas would be to have a Valide Ismail vs. Hoist Gracie match on the show since Gracie is looking for revenge against Ismail for losing by a choke last year and Ismail is holding out for a big payday for the rematch. It's not certain how relations between UFO and Rings are this week. Naoya Ogawa is still scheduled to face Yoshihisa Yamamoto of Rings in August on a Rings show. However, Ogawa was to face Rings veteran Dick Frey for the NWA title on June 29th UFO show in Osaka, but things fell through and neither Frey or Hansa Nyman will work the UFO show, leaving UFO will basically nothing. UFO announced its lineup as Ogawa vs. Gary Steele from England for the NWA title as the main event, plus Kazunari Murakami vs. Billy Scott former UWFI and Kingdom wrestler out of Nashville, Dan Severn vs. Justin McCulley, don't be surprised to see a heel turn for Severn to build up for an Ogawa rematch, Gerard Gordeau vs. Frederick Yelm, who faced Ogawa recently in New Jersey, Dai Kyojin, which is not a name but basically means the giant in Japanese, vs. Eric Ulrich, Yuki Ishikawa of Battlers vs. Lee Younggun, Jason Bress vs. Taro Obata and Sean McCulley vs. Ikuto Hidaka. With Satoru Sayama gone, taking the fourth Tiger mask with him, and no Alexander Otsuka, there is basically little shot at much of a quality of match on this entire card and it's a terrible lineup from a name standpoint as well. The biggest indie show in a very slow week was the Masami Soranaka Memorial Show put on by Battlerts at Karakuen Hall drawing an announced 1,682 on June 9. The show honored the late son-in-law of Carl Gotch who was a coach and booker for both the first and second incarnations of the UWF along with the early days of the pro-wrestling Fujiwara Gumi group, which spawned both Battlerts and Pancrase, and was actually the person responsible for booking Ken Shamrock into Japan as a work shooter which led to him doing actual shoots. Soradaka passed away in 1992 at the age of 47 from cancer and was very well liked by everyone in the wrestling community both in the Japanese offices he worked for as well as in Tampa. Several of the Pancrase wrestlers who were with Soranaka came to this show to greet Soranaka's wife and children, among them were Masakatsu Funaki, Yusuke Fukatsuomi Inagaki, and Kimu Kunyoku. K1 fighter Mitsuya Nagai also came to the show. Joe Malenko also returned to Japan and Carl Greco, who we raved about in last week's issue, was given a new name as Carl Malenko and they formed a tag team beating Yuki Ishikawa and Daisuke Ikeda in 1425 when Carl made Ishikawa submit, so Carl is getting a push. Yui Sano retained the FMW Junior title, 
which is no longer recognized in FMW beating Katsumi Yujuta while Satoru Sayama also appeared on the show beating Ikuto Hidaka, so Sayama hasn't given up pro wrestling yet. Mitsuko Nishiwaki 31, who was briefly pushed in a top role with all Japan women in the late 80s period after the Crush Gals but before Akira Hokuto and Manami Toyota were the top stars feuding with Bull Nakano and Medusa and then retiring, married sumo wrestler KO, 26, who was a star in Japan and a ceremony before 570 people at the new Atani Hotel in Tokyo. Many of the top women wrestlers in Japan including Jaguar Yokota, Lina Sasuka, Yumiko Hata and Dump Matsumoto were among the guests as were many of the biggest sumo stars including legends like Aknano, Wakanohara, and Takanomana. JD did a gimmick match on June 11th in Nagoya with a mixed match as JD's Megumi Yabushida, a former women's judo champ, teamed with Masashi Aoyagi, a former karate star who bounced around pro wrestling for years, beating JD's Fang Suzuki and male karate pro wrestler Dayu Kawauchi when Yobushida used the armbar submission on the male pro wrestler. Booker Koto Fuyuki of FMW is restarting women's wrestling but patterning it more after WWF women's wrestling than traditional Japanese women's wrestling. The women will wrestle in sexy costumes and Fuyuki himself will introduce a new valet for himself named Sina Wakana. Among those involved will be Milky Nakayama, former FMW wrestler Kaori Nakayama, Shikaka Shiratori and Emi Motokawa who have wrestled before along with new girls Yuki Kataoka and Yoko Eidake. FMW opened its new tour on June 13th in Okayama with a main event where Koji Nakagawa and Geto won the Brass Knucks tag titles beating Masato Tanaka and Tetsuhiro Kuroda but it was Kuroda who was pinned for the fall by Nakagawa. They retained the belts on the June 15th Karako and Hall show beating Sabu and Super Leather, Mike Kirchner, when Geto pinned Leather with a splash off the top with Leather underneath the title belt. Fuyuki is doing a gimmick where if Tanaka gets pinned in any match, he has to leave FMW. Sabu debuted for his eight-day tour beating Ricky Fuji on the undercard on June 13th. The June 15th main event was a loser eats dog food ladder match with Hayabusa and Tanaka and Kuroda beating Haido and Kanemura and Ganesuk when Kuroda pinned Haido, who then had to eat the dog food. They are also building toward a women's match where the loser has to eat dog food. JWP, Neo Ladies and All Japan Women are all doing singles Grand Prix tournaments on their current shows. For JWP they ran Karako and Hall on June 13th and in a tournament match Azumi Hyuga beat Dynamite Kansai. The final will be August 8th at Karako and Hall. Neo Ladies is called the Neo Ladies Cup. AJW is doing its tournament and the Zaps, Kaoru Ito, and Tomoko Watanabe, are wrestling without the gimmick and under their real names. I believe there was a shoot match on June 13th at Karaku and Hall on the JD show with Momoe Nakanishi of AJW facing JD's Yabushida. Yabushida was expected to win with her background doing real shoots as a national champion in judo, and the match was announced as being no time limit. It was pushed ahead of time as being a shoot, and given that they stopped the match when it was advertised as no time limit makes one think it probably must have been. They fought for one hour, during which Nakanishi took more than 200 punches and the match was stopped and ruled a draw. Also on that show Fang Suzuki and the Bloody won the TWF tag titles beating Kuga and Sumi Sakai and Lina Sasuka kept the TWF singles belt beating Yuko Kasugi. Michinoku Pro opened its new tour on June 12th. On the tour include Taka Michinoku and Sho Fanaki as a main event tag team, Crazy Max from Mexico with Shima Nobunaga and Sumo Fuji teaming with Yoshikazu Taro, I guess Judo Suwa is injured, plus Paro Russo from Tijuana. Here and there. One of the strangest stories occurred on an NWA Georgia show on June 10th in Loganville, Georgia before 100 fans. This was said to not be an angle and did result in criminal charges being pressed and there was even a story in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution regarding the incident. During intermission at about 10 p.m. at the local flea market, with wrestlers in the ring getting photos taken with fans, wrestlers Billy Black, Bill White Jr., and Vic Rose, Stacey Smith, who had worked for the company as recently as one week earlier, came in and attacked promoter Bill Barons. According to Barron's press release, witnesses say Black hit him with an object. The two, after Black hit Barron's got in the ring and told the fans and wrestlers to leave and tried to get in the ring. TJ Gray, one of the wrestlers in the ring who actually owns the ring they use, wouldn't leave and both hit Gray several times in the face, and he was reportedly hospitalized later that evening. Colorado kid Mike Rapata, after discovering this was not an angle, ran to the ring with the other wrestlers in Black, his wife, Rose and a fourth person jumped into two vehicles and sped off. Police arrived and took a report and warrants were issued for both men on simple battery charges and Judge Joseph Ian one said that the documents were authentic and the two were expected to be arrested early this week. 
Where it gets interesting is that Black claimed that he and Rose were doing what Barons had asked them to do and that Gray attacked him while he tried to do an interview and he was defending himself. A report by Larry Goodman stated that Black and Rose pounded Gray pretty badly, breaking his pinky finger and pulling out a batch of his hair. He wrote, while you may be tempted to call this a work, I am convinced otherwise. I was in the back when this erupted. All of a sudden, I see Bert Prentice run past me calling for workers to get out of the locker room and into the ring to help. Have you ever seen Bert run? Mark Davis came by looking for a cell phone to call the police. I got out of the back just in time to see Vic and Billy shuffle out the door. Fans and workers filed out the door and then the lights went out in the building for some reason. Eventually the lights came back on, and people got settled down, but the event stole from any heat the tag title match might have had. In today's environment when fans don't believe even what is real is being real, I wouldn't put filing a false police report past a wrestling promoter as a publicity stunt which isn't saying I think it's a work as much as saying you have to be suspicious of everything in wrestling. Someday wounds always heal so to speak and someday even if it is a shoot, they will probably still work an angle out of all this, such as Vince McMahon's attempt through intermediaries to do the same with Bret Hart regarding the 1997 incident, even if it is a shoot but I'd say if anything is done regarding making an angle out of this at any time in the next several months to one year, then it was probably a publicity stunt. If it was a work, clearly nobody was let in on it and TJ Gray really was punched out. If not, well, just because it's wrestling doesn't mean that on rare occasion real things do happen. The TV show Extra did a story on the Von Erich family with an interview with Kevin. This was scary. He claimed the family had its problems because he believed the devil had a grudge against the family. Even scarier, he talked about his four sons all wanting to become pro wrestlers. A correction from the June 7th issue, in the results of the May 28th Power Pro House show in Memphis at Tim McCarver Stadium, we listed Mike Tierney as beating Baldo, and it was actually Mark Henry who won via DQ. Wrestling International News Magazine, an amateur wrestling publication, ran a feature story in its May 28th issue on Vern Gagne. The story had some interesting background information on Gagne, now 73. As a freshman at the University of Minnesota back in 1944, Ganya, then 18, became the youngest starter ever on the Golden Gopher football team and after football season captured the Big 9, now Big 10, wrestling title. Due to World War II, he joined the Marine Corps and played with the famous El Toro Marines football team. When the war was over, the Chicago Rockets of the All-American Football Conference, which a few years later merged with the NFL, offered him a deal but he decided to go back to college where he started three more seasons in football including being an honorable mention All-American, and captured three more Big Nine titles, two AAU national titles and two NCAA titles including a legendary match to win the NCAA heavyweight title in 1949 beating Dick Hutton in the finals in overtime. He was an alternate to Henry Wittenberg on the 1948 Olympic team, having lost the spot in a close match, and Wittenberg went on to win the gold medal. After college, he was drafted by the Chicago Bears but injured his ankle playing in the old college All-Star game. After the injury, the Bears weren't interested in him and he wound up in pro wrestling and was one of its biggest stars and most influential people both as a performer and later a promoter for the next four decades although Ganya would not finish high on many lists for the most well-loved performer or promoter in history. June 12th in Memphis opened with footage from the show the previous night at the New Daisy Theater where announcer Corey Macklin got involved in a Jimmy Valiant and Brandon Baxter vs. Derek King and C.B. Wyatt, you have to see this guy to believe him, match. Also on the show, Len Kulka and J.R. Smooth attacked Dirty White Boy and shoved down Dirty White Girl. After White, Bulldog Reigns and King were working on Robbie D. after a TV match, Macklin, Valiant and Baxter made the save. Crowd still popped big for Valiant who was one of Memphis' all-time biggest draws in the glory years of the late 70s and early 80s. Smooth and Angle brought in a third man called OG to feud with Chris Cannonball, Carl Ouellette. White Boy wrestled Kolka and then Smooth and OG attacked White Boy. White Girl ran out of the building and came back with Doug Gilbert who cleaned house. They're doing an angle with Gilbert that Randy Hales doesn't want him around. Announcer Dave Brown sold it like he knew Gilbert wasn't supposed to be there. Brown wouldn't let Gilbert near the mic because he's supposedly not part of the show. Gilbert was screaming he was going to shoot while Brown tried to keep him from talking. Randy Hales came out and said Gilbert would never work for PPW because he'd threatened people's lives in the past and worked opposition and threatened to have him arrested. After a break they showed White Boy telling him to leave so he wouldn't get in more trouble while Brown told the camera people not to show him on camera. White Boy came out for an interview and Hales explained he wasn't going to use Gilbert because he couldn't trust him. White Boy said that he wouldn't go to Jonesboro for his next booking unless Gilbert was with him. Hale said no way so White Boy said he was leaving the company. 
Kulka OG and smooth then jumped white boy and handcuffed white girl to the ropes. Hales ran out to the parking lot and told Gilbert to come back. Gilbert came in with a chair and cleaned house. Then Gilbert shoved down Hales and Hales told Gilbert that's why he's not in the company. Some notes on recent shows. Terry Gordy seemed a lot more with it, so to speak, than he had in several years when he came in for a weekend two weeks back. His son Ray, who is in his early 20s, facially looked like him but wasn't a big guy. Terry Gordy was so big as a teenager that he was actually wrestling indies from the age of 13 or 14, and was a main eventer before his 18th birthday. C.B. Wyatt, who looks to be about 5 to 5 and 125 pounds and the phrase pencil thick arms was created for him, is doing a gimmick where he's Derek King's head of security kind of doing a reverse Ralphus gimmick. You almost need to see the high spot he worked with Nicole Base, and I'm not bringing it up because of the size difference but because of what happens when you get two total amateurs and they're trying to do a high spot. There is legit heat between NWA President Howard Brody and Dennis Coraluzzo. Apparently after the June 4th show in Pine Hill, New Jersey, several different people under the direction of Coraluzzo and Doug Gilbert, who were pulling the prank, called up Brody and said there was a mistake in the NWA title match and that Neoya Ogawa, not knowing the rules, laid down. The ref kept stopping his count but Ogawa didn't get up, and they had counted the pin and the title changed hands and Ogawa was going nuts. Brody, in a panic, trying to mend fences with UFO who would see this as a double cross, started calling Japan and the word actually got to Antonio Inoki before hours later they admitted it was a rib. The current plan for the NWA 51st anniversary show at the Grady Cole Center in Charlotte, North Carolina on September 25th is for a Dan Severn vs. Naoya Ogawa main event. Howard Brody was trying to put together a Dory vs. Terry Funk singles match with Antonio Inoki as referee but both Funk's asking price to do such a match may be prohibitive and it's most likely it won't be happening. NWA New England's team of Eric Spraxia and Knuckles Nelson went to Dallas this weekend and beat local team Extreme to keep the NWA tag titles. ISBW will be in Secaucus, New Jersey at the high school on June 26 with King Kong Bundy, Devin Storm, A. Starling, Inferno Kid and more. Ted DiBiase spoke at George South's church, shows under the name Exodus Wrestling Alliance over the weekend in Baton Rouge and Panama City and will be at Howard Payne University in Brownwood, Texas with DiBiase speaking on June 23rd. MMA. Pancras ran a show on June 11 at Karakuen Hall which drew a sellout 2,000 fans with Yoshiki Takahashi winning a majority decision over John LeBay after going the time limit in the main event. Four of the six matches went the time limit. Sanae Kikuta, who has done pride shows, made his debut beating unknown Eric Gedek in 120 with a choke. The other Americans on the show were Chris Little, who beat Daisuke Watanabe in 530 with a front guillotine and Jason Delucia, who won a unanimous decision over Ikuiza Minowa. Masaaki Sadake's opponent on the K1 June 20th show will be Yoki Overholzer from South Africa. Kenji Kawaguchi from Shudo appears to be off the July 16th UFC pay-per-view show and there are rumors that Ebenezer Fontes Braga, who is booked against Kazushi Sakuraba on the July 4th Pride show, will pull out as well and that possibly a Jeremy Horn vs. Paul Jones match will result from all this. Horn captured a hook and shoot promotion title over the weekend winning a tournament beating Scott Ventimiglia with an arm bar in 7 minutes in Evansville, Indiana. Promoter Jeff Osborne noted the show drew its all-time best crowd of 1,364 in a building that runs weekly pro wrestling events that are drawing 50 to 60 paid. Two matches have been added to the Pride show on July 4th at the Yokohama Arena. Nobuaki Kakuta, the K1 referee and sometimes competitor who is 38 years old, faces Hiroki Kurosawa, who had a really weird match on one of the early Pride shows, and Carlos Newton, who has a good reputation for fights in EFC, Pride and UFC among others, faces Shunsuke Matsui, a Takata team member who had done pro wrestling with Kingdom. The Tom Erickson vs. Carlos Barreto match on that show has already fallen apart since it is expected Barreto will instead face Igor Vovchinchin on that show which would be an interesting match since it's Vovchinchin's highest profile opponent in years if not ever. On a show in Davie, Florida, Marcus Conan Silveira, the former EFC heavyweight champion, beat Pat Smith, a UFC pioneer who went to the finals against Hoist Gracie in the UFC 2 show, via strikes from the mount on June 12. The famed Thailand cross-dressing kickboxer who was featured some months back in Sports Illustrated and beat Kyoko Inoue in the man vs. women mixed rules shoot match fought on June 10 at Karakuen Hall but lost and said after the match that he wanted to have his sex change operation and then quit fighting. ECW. The TNN deal still has not been officially announced. The plan seems to be starting in September that ECW will tape two hours of television every weekend. 
The TNN tapings will be done every other week, with two shows taped per session. These shows will be done live to tape, rather than the heavy amount of post-production miracles that Paul Heyman is noted for in editing 15 minutes matches down to 3 minutes of high spots and making many wrestlers appear to look a lot better than they really are. The syndicated tapings will be held the other weekend and will be done using the same formula. While the contract is not signed, so it isn't really clear yet and probably will become a feeling out process in the first few months of the show, the TNN tapings will be tamer, but how tamer remains to be seen. It also appears that no footage from the TNN show can appear on syndication, which really hurts the syndicated show when it comes to Heyman's attempts to use a lot of footage to tell stories with angles. For Heyman, another challenge in doing tapings like this is that the second hour of every TNN taping will air after the first hour of the syndicated taping the next week, similar to WCW with the second hour of Thunder, and we've seen how WCW simply can't run a coherent promotion weeks ahead so the second hour becomes a throwaway. Basically, Heyman will have to have storylines down and television formatted at least one week ahead at all times for his storylines to make sense, unless he simply does no angles on his syndicated shows. Syndication is definitely going to become less important in the scheme of things, and is probably being kept largely as a backup in case the TNN deal doesn't last because if ECW was to drop syndicated television for TNN, and something were to happen with TNN, the company simply can't afford to be in a position where all its eggs are in one basket. There was no real surprise regarding Sid showing up at WCW after he missed TV the previous week. There seems to be the attitude of simply keeping things going and not to shoot any major angles this summer, figuring when TNN starts that is the time to hit the major angles and perhaps redo some of the angles of the past but with new characters figuring a lot of the audience if not the vast majority will be people who have never seen the angles in the first place. For whatever this is worth, Paul Heyman no longer is writing checks to talent after the shows. The checks are instead written by Gene Sharkowski during the week and given to Debbie Beaumont and passed out at the shows. ECW has switched banks and the new bank has sufficient funds and the boys were told no more checks would bounce. Since the house shows have not drawn well of late aside from a $100,000 house in Detroit in late May, some sort of influx of new money must have come in. As it seems to stand right now for the July 18th heat wave pay-per-view in Dayton, Ohio, it looks to be Rob Van Dam vs. Balls Mahoney for the TV title and Sabu vs. Just Incredible and probably a three-way with Little Guido, Yoshihiro Tajiri, and Super Crazy. The June 17th debut show in the Chicago area in Villa Park, Illinois sold out a few weeks ahead of time. Christopher Daniels is scheduled to debut on that show. Heyman wants him as a regular but he's been working for Victor Quinones in Japan and Puerto Rico. Sabu missed the weekend shows working for FMW. Taz missed a few shows this week due to attending a wedding. Lance Storm missed the weekend due to immigration paperwork not being completed. He had been living in Florida, but moved back to Calgary. Shows overall didn't draw well in the Carolinas this past weekend with paid attendances of 800 on June 10th in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Grady Cole Center, 900 on June 11th in Columbia, South Carolina, 700 on June 12th in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and 800 on June 13th at the annex of the Lawrence Joel Coliseum in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Jazz, the valet for Just Incredible who actually was never given a ring name, appears to be gone. The page 6 gossip column by Richard Johnson in the New York Post on June 14th included an item about Rob Van Dam's appearance on NBC's Saturday morning show City Guys. The item read, NBC has unwittingly put a pothead in its squeaky clean Saturday morning kitty lineup. Extreme Championship wrestler Rob Van Dam who brags about his cannabis consumption and wears a High Times t-shirt in ECW promos was signed to guest star on an episode of the Peacock Network's City Guys, a popular Saturday morning show. The episode, slated to air next fall, was already taped when NBC brass were alerted to Van Dam's hooch habit. Network insiders say the hire is embarrassing for the show's producer, Peter Engel, who has crusaded for clean kids television. We did a storyline regarding professional wrestling and needed a professional wrestler, an NBC rep told Page Six. We went through the normal channels we go through to get guest stars, and that's how we got Rob Van Dam. Nobody had any idea about his pot smoking and he certainly wasn't smoking pot while he was here. The story went on to quote Van Dam's High Times interview talking about fans offering him pot when he goes to the ring in the RVD 420 signs. 420 is a pot smoking reference. Let's smoke pot chance. Van Dam claimed that ECW isn't aimed at kids so it doesn't send a bad message to kids, and he said kids can't look at Rob Van Dam in High Times magazine and think it's cool to go ahead and smoke pot. It's not cool for kids to smoke pot. For any kid, pot smoking is going to get in their way and be an obstruction. 
They continued similar house shows that they've been doing, with the big spot almost every night being when Balls Mahoney, who has even got his hair and beard trimmed to look more like Cactus Jack, takes a power bomb through a table set on fire, and covered with thumbtacks. Earlier in the match Mahoney also blows a fireball. With Tommy Dreamer down due to his back injury, his matches with Steve Corino consist of Mike Work and a short brawl which ends up with Francine actually pinning Corino. David Cash, going by his real name, he's better known as David Jericho and has also worked as Davey Morton, worked the undercards and did well. He'd worked ECW more than one year ago and was impressive but didn't move to the Northeast. They taped TV in Columbia, South Carolina and started heating up the Dudleys vs. Credible and Storm. They hinted at it on this week's television. In a Mahoney vs. Credible match, the Dudleys came out and gave both men 3D. In the TV main with Rob Van Dam vs. D. Von Dudley, Credible came out and hit Bubba with a cane while Mahoney also interfered leading to Devon getting pinned, however Van Dam and Mahoney ended up going at it after the match because Van Dam didn't want his help. The television show this week was definitely one to forget. They aired old clips of Steve Corino interviews and vignettes, a highlight package of last year's Heat Wave, which was a hell of a show, which took up the first 27 minutes of the show. The first match was a quickie with Taka Michinoku over Mosco de la Merced. It's so annoying when the ring announcer gives the weights in kilos, since we are in America. It's even more annoying when the weights given are so ridiculous, as the weight they announce Mosco it would be 169 and Taka would be 190, but when you see the two, it's obvious Mosco is about 15 pounds heavier than Taka. Match was decent with Taka winning in less than 5 minutes with a Michinoku driver. They did an interview with Dreamer talking about having two bulging discs and being out of action. Lance Storm did an interview teasing he and Credible vs. Dudley's as an upcoming program. The only other match that aired had Jerry Lynn over Tony DeVito in less than 6 minutes with the Cradle Pile Driver. Lynn's a good worker and DeVito is a solid worker but it's hardly a marquee TV main event. After the match they showed the confrontation tease with Van Dam and Lynn. The guy who bid $11,999.99 for Tammy Sitch's old breast implants that hardened, or WWF implants, didn't pay so they're back up for auction. WCW Nitro on June 14th at the MCI Center in Washington, D.C. drew 9,712 fans, 8,066 paying $278,055. The show opened with Hennig and Barry Windham over Vincent and Brian Adams in 10.05 when Windham pinned Vince after hitting him over the head with Bobby Duncan Jr.'s cowbell. I couldn't believe Windham would actually go out in public let alone wrestle in those shorts that were eight sizes too small. Hennig was a one-man show here. I didn't say it was a good show as it was a terrible match with no heat. They aired clips of the Master P press conference. Savage came out for an interview and made very little sense. Savage said the Wolfpack sucks. I'm glad he did because I didn't even know they even existed at this point. Kidman pinned Morris in 359 with a shooting star press in a good match. The first hour ended without one thing being promoted for the rest of the show. Flair and Anderson came out for an interview. Flair asked Piper to come out and asked him to be the vice president of the world. Now that was funny. Piper actually did a decent interview. Dean Malenko came out and he did a good interview before Piper decked him and started strapping him. Bagwell made the save but they tripled on him until Bagwell made a comeback. Miller pinned Norton in 341 with a sidekick. Unbelievably bad. This made the match the previous night with Horace look like a Misawa Kobashi classic. Bischoff was making fun of Jim Ross and other wrestling announcers who don't know how to properly call kicks. I could waste face saying how bad he came off and why, but you all know it to begin with. Van Hammer pinned Disco Inferno in 750 with a back suplex. Bischoff said during this match he thought Bret Hart would be back. Bischoff was desperately trying to sell the idea that if Hammer was more aggressive in the ring he could be another Benoit. Except for the fact he has no clue how to sell and is way too mechanical in the ring. If Bischoff just said Hammer has the potential to be another Sid Vicious caliber worker minus the charisma, he'd at least have some credibility. Fans didn't believe him and chanted boring. This match was almost as bad as the previous one. Disco gave ref Scott Dickinson a stunner after the match. David Finley pinned Brian Knobs after hitting him with a chair and after Hawk hit Knobs with a kendo stick in 444. This was a surprisingly good match. Nash did an interview and Rena Merrow was shown. Bischoff out of nowhere said, it's on. Nash was dying out there as the crowd didn't react to him, and then started chanting for Sable. He challenged Sid which got a shockingly little pop. Sid was shown on the video screen accepting. 
Malenko and Benoit and Saturn and Bagwell beat Flair and Piper and Page and Canyon in 1527 when Bagwell pinned Flair after the buff blockbuster. Real good match. Why is Canyon on the old guy's team when he may have been the youngest guy in the ring? Bischoff was ripping Flair to shreds blaming him for every problem in WCW and for the fact the young guys don't get pushed. Bischoff complained about how Benoit and Bagwell haven't gotten their fair push. Well, he was half right. Benoit was great particularly with Flair as those two did most of the work in the match. Piper works smart but he's so limited because of his hip that he can't bump much. He was better than he's been in a long time. The announcers really played up the significance of Bagwell scoring a pin on Flair, so at least that aspect of this was good. Rick Steiner no contest Hawk in about 7 minutes. They went backstage and Hawk took sickening punishment. He took a bump off the roof of a Ford Explorer. They destroyed a Harley that Bischoff acted like it was his. Hawk took one sick bump after another. Finally Steiner shoved him through the roof of the Explorer and Sting came up and attacked Steiner. That was pretty clever. Sting whipped Steiner through an RV. Sting then grabbed the house mic. He was talking about dogs but the interview was so bad he needed to be muzzled. Sting ended up hitting Steiner in the stomach with his bat. Conan and Mysterio Jr. beat Parka and Psychosis in 625 with Master P and the No Limit Soldiers hanging out. The really muscular NLS guy I believe is Chase Tatum, a power plant guy who is going to be with Conan, Mysterio Jr., Brad Armstrong and maybe one or two others in Master P's crew. Since they were in a featured spot, they all had their working shoes on. Conan even did a tope. Bischoff started talking about how WCW was the innovators using Master P and brought up how the NWO was the most copied gimmick in wrestling history. I think the New Japan Company vs. Company angle Bischoff saw while on a trip there that he actually seems to think he came up with is the most copied angle in recent history. They played Hennig's song but Master P broke the CD. Finally Sid didn't come out so Nash wrestled Savage for one minutes before Medusa and the rest of the women interfered for the DQ and Sid came out. Fans were chanting for Goldberg even before the outside interference. Sting ended up making the save as the show went off the air. With the decline in WCW Saturday Night Ratings, a big push is being made to add Dusty Rhodes to the broadcast team. Like that'll help. How about putting some names and angles that mean something on the show? Tank Abbott has been at all the recent tapings but has barely been used. His entourage hasn't been brought in. Piper's interviews, particularly the jokes that don't get over, are largely scripted by his bodyguard Craig Malley who some of you may remember for being one of the guys in that horrible skit where Piper fought these guys to make a team for an uncensored pay-per-view. Trimark Video will be releasing Wrestling with Shadows to a wider market. WCW has already grown tired of using Ricky Rackman which is why he hasn't been on Nitro. Neither Bischoff nor Nash were at the Thunder tapings in Syracuse. Actually it's been a long time since Bischoff has been at a Thunder taping so that really isn't news. The tapings drew 4,864, 4,001 paying $88,011, on June 10th in Syracuse, New York. Savage attacked Brian Adams before the show thinking it was Nash. Gene interviewed Bagwell acting all excited saying that Bagwell would face Disco on the pay-per-view and Bagwell complained that was what the problem was. Miller came out and challenged him. What a main event that promised to be. Conan and Mysterio Jr. beat Viano V and Psychosis in 524 when Mysterio Jr. pinned Psychosis with a springboard spinning head scissors. Crowd was really into this match and they weren't into much. Miller no contest Bagwell in 438. Disco did commentary and he was funny talking about lowering himself to face Bagwell on the pay-per-view. Norton ran in and attacked Miller while Disco gave the stunner to Bagwell. Benoit and Saturn came out for an interview. Saturn said he was mad because in their tag team match, Flair wouldn't take his tag. Uh, that was Benoit who was Flair's partner in the match where they shot that angle. Savage beat Adams in 536 and he and the girls beat up Horace as well, and finally took Johnny Boone's pants off. Thank God he wasn't wearing one of Billy Gunn's thongs or it would have been really disgusting television. Rick Steiner beat Finley in a TV title match after a bulldog off the top and a move similar to Kensuke Sasaki's power strangle in 526. Nash was interviewed on the phone from Scottsdale, Arizona which is actually where he re was. Another bad interview. He wanted the elbow reinstated. Boy, that angle went somewhere didn't it? Saturn beat Canyon in 1325 when Page interfered and Benoit made the save. It turned into a tag match and then was announced as a title match ending when Benoit pinned Canyon after a headbutt off the top in three minutes to capture the belts. The ring was filling up with garbage thrown by the fans and there were a lot of fights in the stands.
For the June 17 Thunder, they taped Hennigan Duncan over Texas Hangman, Disco over Scotty Riggs, Canyon over Prince Aokia, Morris and Nobbs over Silver King and La Parka and Booker T over Barbarian as the TV main event. The place really emptied out after the live show ended. At one point Conan's group with Mysterio Jr. and some others was talked about as being called the Filthy Animals, but that was turned down in favor of No Limit Soldiers. They also nixed the idea of Kidman being in that group. Bischoff on an internet chat claimed Scott Hall wasn't getting paid on his hiatus from WCW, he's currently going cross-country with his wife and family in a Winnebago. Others are saying he is still getting paid, but at a much reduced rate from his $30,000 weekly salary. Insane Clown Posse is claiming on their website that they are headed to WCW. Negotiations are said to be very close for Shane Douglas to come in. Tori Wilson has been at some of the recent tapings but since David Flair is training at the power plant and not being used, she isn't being used either. Nothing new on the Goldberg front. Goldberg appeared for WCW this week at the Toy Fair in New York and told people there that it was inevitable in three years that he would face Austin. There has apparently been some backdoor communication between the two discussing the feasibility and idea of when each's contract runs out that they would either in the same company or on their own try and put together a show where they'd headline against each other as unlikely as that would seem to be. WCW is playing hardball since Goldberg has had his contract renegotiated several times and is figuring that he can't afford to sit out three years in the prime of his career when he's hot. Goldberg apparently sees wrestlers in the company who aren't as popular as he is nor working as many dates as he does making far more money and may have begun to understand the nasty politics of wrestling. Bischoff in commentary tried to imply that the reason WCW was losing in ratings was because of the misfortune of Hogan, Goldberg and Luger simultaneously out with injuries while Hart is out at the same time. Flair picked up a lot of respect in the dressing room for putting Bagwell over clean without a fuss as the younger guys see him as the only member of the old guard to do so. It's hard to ascertain how much of Bischoff's knocks on Flair are at work since it appears Bischoff is going to do a power struggle program against Flair and Piper down the road, and how much is reality because Flair has enemies in power that have succeeded where so many others have failed in finally making him look out of date. Bischoff has taken a lot of knocks, and deservedly so when doing an internet chat and being asked why the horsemen were broken up and claiming that they had focused on the horsemen since November, and the numbers have been in a decline and that sums it up. Since the horsemen were never given a major push as a unit, to blame them for a ratings decline as a unit is ridiculous. Fact is Benoit and Malenko were not successful drawing ratings as a team. Flair was the most successful person in the company at drawing ratings. They were never together enough to know if Flair's rub could have helped Benoit and Malenko the way it did for Tully and Arna generation ago and there were reasons for that. The idea of blaming Flair for the ratings decline and then praising Nash for his booking is so ridiculously transparent. Flair did an internet interview where he was ridiculously sarcastic about those statements saying that he was too old to work a good match and too old to do a good interview and that since Arn Anderson also can't do a good interview anymore that's why they never let him talk on television. He did say that he would never do a program with Shane Douglas, Bischoff brought that up as a good idea, and responded to Vicious coming in with equal sarcasm. Actually Nash wields the stroke as far as who gets pushed and who doesn't, but Dusty Rhodes is probably doing the most actual booking work for the rank-and-file wrestlers in the company. Nash concentrates on his program and a couple of his friends and Rhodes and Kevin Sullivan fill up the shows. The other two house shows of the week were the Saturday night taping on June 8th in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which drew 1,109 paying $23,765 and the Legends 4 show in Buffalo, New York in memory of Ilio Di Paolo, which drew 6,215. Actually 10,034 in the building, paying $126,177 which has to be considered a major flip in the 21,000-seat Marine Midland Arena for a show that drew sellouts or near sellouts the previous three times. As it turned out, Stu Hart didn't attend the show due to his going to Kansas City regarding the lawsuit. Public Enemy is expected to be brought back and two cold Scorpio's name has been bouncing around as a possibility. Most reports are that consideration to Chris Condito and Tammy Sitch at this point is nil. I think the best way to get a job in WCW nowadays is to screw up at your previous job, and if you've screwed up more than once your odds of getting a job increase. Bischoff attempted to defend the timing of firing Davy Boy Smith by saying that had he known what was going on that the timing would have been different. He said the decision to send Smith a letter was made early the preceding week, then drafted by the attorneys and signed by him, all of which happened before anyone knew he was in the hospital. True, but if you check out the timing of the day the letter was actually sent by the company and the day word got out everywhere in wrestling of Smith's hospitalization and being in critical condition, 
Bischoff's timing analogy falls apart as the letter may have been drafted first but it was mailed after word got out. He said this doesn't change the fact the company had been carrying Smith for a long time without hearing from him and telling him what his status was. He said he regrets how it turned out and wished it wouldn't have happened the way it did. A correction from last week's Observer where we noted the Owen Hart cover of Box E. Lucha was the first time since the death of Art Bar in late 1994 that a non-Latino wrestler made the cover of the oldest wrestling magazine in existence. Actually that isn't true as Corazon de Leon, Chris Jericho, made the cover in March 1995. June 25th in Auburn Hills, Michigan at the Palace with Bigelow vs. Sting vs. DDP, Savage vs. Flair, Hawk vs. Knobs, Kidman and Mysterio Jr. vs. Hennig and Duncan, Saturn vs. Canyon, Bagwell vs. Jericho, Silver King and Dandy vs. Psychosis and Parka and Aokia vs. Riggs. WWF Brian Christopher blew out his ACL on June 9th in Portland, Maine and will be undergoing major surgery sometime this month. No date has been set as they are trying to book him with Dr. James Andrews who has a heavy schedule. Christopher had an MRI on June 14th which revealed not only a torn ACL, but minor ligament tears and some cartilage fragments. His return after surgery would be anywhere from three to six months. He and Scott Taylor were just put together on Heat which aired a few days later and was taped the previous day doing a new hoodie type gimmick. It's closer to a younger version of Public Enemy than to Conan and Rey Mysterio Jr. as stated last week but obviously it's on hold for a while. Edge was injured, suffering a minor concussion taking a bump on his head from a DDT at the June 8th TV tapings in Worcester, Massachusetts. He was back on the road a few days later but stayed in the corner as Gangrel and Christian worked tag matches mainly against the Hardy Boys in bouts that from a lot of reports stole the shows. No truth to any rumors about Reckless Youth having signed a 90-day contract. He has been under consideration for a developmental deal but hasn't signed, and WWF would never sign such a deal for 90 days. Both Luthes and Harley Race were quoted in newspaper articles this past week regarding the death of Owen Hart. In a sports column by Bob Molinaro in the Norfolk newspaper, Thes said he was both confused and angry by Hart's death, noting he's been friends with the family for years and even at one point did some training with Owen. I don't think I have ever felt as old or as out of touch as I do today. Thes wrote a piece expressing personal remorse for ignoring the current state of wrestling, he stopped watching years ago, but didn't like to publicly criticize the product too heavily saying that people were just making a living giving the crowd what they wanted, even though it isn't wrestling. I don't mean to be unkind, but I don't have to tell you about the audience. They're not too bright. He went on to say it took the death of a friend's son to make him admit just how sick the industry has become. Race, in an article in the June 6th Charleston Post and Courier talked about Hart's death and the fact he was also an eyewitness to the death of Mike DiBiase in 1969 which has been widely reported, as the previous U.S. in-ring death. Actually Ron Dupree in 1975 of a heart attack after a match was addressing room death, and before that in the early 70s, Alberto Torres, Luis Hernandez and Luther Lindsay all died after matches from heart attacks. DiBiase's heart attack took place during a match on July 3, 1969, in Lubbock, Texas against Gary Fletcher. Race noted that he was one of the last people to talk to Owen Hart before his death, and actually said to him to make sure his rope didn't break, and he and Hart left. Race was the booker of the Amarillo Territory, working for Dory Funk Sr. on that night in Lubbock. DiBiase, the stepfather of Ted DiBiase, had spent all day moving and complained before the match that he was feeling tired. About 10 minutes into the match, DiBiase grabbed his chest and fell into the ropes and then through the ropes and fell onto the floor. Race went out and tried pumping his heart and mouth to mouth and he had a pulse going but died en route to the hospital. In regard to WCW's cancellation of its August 2nd Boston Nitro date due to among other things, WWF putting tickets on sale for its August 30th Raw show before their show took place. The show was cancelled also because WCW was afraid it wouldn't be able to draw well at this point in Boston and also because they felt the building double-crossed them by adding the WWF Raw date for August 30th a date added due to every Monday becoming a taping with the new fall schedule of going live every week, and that was an open date and the other shows were in the Northeast. WWF officials noted that in this latest incarnation of the wrestling war that both sides had played under the rules that they wouldn't put tickets on sale for a show in a building until after the opposition show had taken place to avoid confusion of the marketplace. However, the rules were changed by WCW when they put tickets on sale for their November 9, 1998 Nassau Coliseum show before the WWF date on August 21. The building manager actually refused to allow WCW to put the tickets on sale so WCW went over his head to SMG which manages the Coliseum to get its tickets put on sale sooner. 
A similar situation happened in Lexington at Rupp Arena when WCW put tickets for its March 18th date on sale before the WWF February 18th date. As of press time, the first UPN weekly show is scheduled for September 2nd and will be taped on August 31st in Worcester, Massachusetts. There is a chance the debut of the weekly show may be moved up a week to August 28th, if so the first taping would be August 26th, in Kansas City. WWF The Music fell to number 105 on the charts this week with 13,038 units sold. The Insane Clown Posse CD fell from number 4 to number 15 in its second week with 67,054 units sold. Vince McMahon will appear on Conan O'Brien on June 24 and the issue of George magazine that comes out this week has a WWF feature scheduled. The award for the worst job of news coverage of the Owen Hart situation goes to KSHP in Kansas City, which on June 6 ran an interview with former wrestler Stevie Wild Thing Ray, not to be confused with the WCW wrestler of the same name. Ray claimed to have friends that are insiders in the WWF because he works in the food supplement sales business. He claimed one of two things were the real story, that either, because of wrestling with shadows, that he was giving credence to the theory that Hart may have been murdered. The station threw out the allegedly's all over the place to protect itself but this had no business on the air. He said the other possibility is that Hart actually wasn't dead and would reappear on Raw in a new role, saying, he might be the higher power. The NHL's Colorado Avalanche had a one-minute dressing room prayer for Hart. House shows this past week saw the TV taping on June 8 in Worcester, Massachusetts draw a sellout 11,482 paying $315,321, June 9 in Portland, Maine drew 6,757 paying $142,545, June 10 in Lowell, Massachusetts drew 6,072 paying $166,310, June 11 in Detroit drew 14,239 paying $313,180. June 12 in Pittsburgh drew 15,099 paying $333,826 and June 13 in Cleveland drew 15,339 paying $350,955. Portland and Lowell didn't have Undertaker or Austin, so Rock beating Bossman in a night stick on a pole match in about five minutes and Big Show over Viscera and Body Slam challenge matches said to be horrible were the top bouts. Detroit, Pittsburgh and Cleveland headlined with Austin over Undertaker via DQ. I believe it's the first WWF house show not to sell out the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh in a long time although it was still a huge house. Apparently the plan for Vince to be the higher power wasn't decided until the last minute as several were considered. Mick Foley was among those asked and he turned it down as the plan apparently was to turn a top babyface heel. Some guys who have limited date contracts, 15 per month maximums and the company is generally running about 18 shows per month, are being strongly encouraged to work those extra dates. The 2000 Royal Rumble will be January 23rd at Madison Square Garden. Pay-per-view sites for the rest of this year are July 25th in Buffalo, August 22nd in Minneapolis, September 26th in Charlotte and November 14th in Detroit for Survivor Series we don't have a location for the October 17th show yet. Mark Henry is being encouraged to drop from his current 400 pounds down to the 340 range and probably won't get a serious push until the scale starts moving. Due to the heart death, the -the over-the-edge show is almost a buried item. When showing clips of the Taker title win from that show, instead of listing it as happening at over-the-edge as it would normally be written, it was instead said pay-per-view last month. Nobody has told me this, but I'd be willing to bet that next year the May pay-per-view show will be given a new name there has to be a reason Bruce Pritchard has these cameo sightings on TV from time to time. At one point he was scheduled for an on-air role as Glenn Ruth's manager in a revised Hale Clown gimmick but that hasn't been talked about much of late and these kind of plans change almost daily. Steve Williams is still being paid under his WWF contract and there has been at least some talk of bringing him back in September. Williams had a guaranteed three-year deal which had a provision regarding being paid if injured and not being fired if injured. WWF is looking at unloading the former Debbie Reynolds Hotel in Las Vegas and using the capital to purchase a different piece of property in Las Vegas that would accommodate an arena in the hotel and adequate parking. The Beaver Cleavage gimmick is in the process of being re-evaluated. Shannon Hall, a former model, cheerleader and boxer, Nicole Bass, the woman who plays Ryan Shamrock and Mariana Comlos, the woman who plays Mrs. Cleavage, are in camp this week training under Tom Pritchard to become eventual in-ring performers. Kurt Angle worked the house shows this week against Tiger Ali Singh. He's not due to start on television anytime soon and will still work Memphis. They bring him in for dark matches at all TV tapings and used him on house shows since they were in the Northeast and it allowed him to work his home city of Pittsburgh which was on the week run. 
the readers' pages. Owen Hart. Owen Hart along with Chris Benoit are one of the reasons I'm a wrestling fan today. I grew up watching Stampede Wrestling and during that period, Hart was the heavyweight champion feuding with the likes of Mock and Singh, Great Gama and Champagne Jerry Morrow, and Johnny Smith. His aerial and technical wrestling ability amazed me, as well as the fact that it didn't seem like a big deal that he was a small guy who could believably kick ass on bigger guys. He wasn't the best interview, but who was in that territory? None of the wrestlers there were great talkers. They spoke like real people would, which gave the show a kind of believability. As his career progressed, I think then sort of held him back. That one weakness hurt him, especially over the past year, notably when he was supposed to be a face against a cool heel like Hunter Hearst Helmsley. For me, the most exciting time in wrestling was the summer of 1997, with the Canada vs. USA battles where I could cheer heels like Owen and still be part of the masses. His death saddened me, but it really hit me watching Raw. All that day in the Canadian media, the story was treated as a top story with some stations treating it as the lead story. Every show gave Owen respect and treated the event like a tragedy, but also did the requisite is wrestling going too far? Stories, which I, in one sense, enjoyed that someone had brought up the question, but at the same time thought it shouldn't have been brought up in this situation. After Rick Rude's death, a lot of questions should have been asked, but in this case, Owen fell from the roof of the Kemper Arena. It was a wrestling scriptwriter who put him there, yes, but it was an accident. It was strange seeing Brett in interviews, as in one, he'd appear angry and bitter, and in another, he'd be low-key and philosophical. This can be understood in times like this, but it was weird to watch nonetheless. I can see a lot coming from all this. I know the circumstances are different, but is this like what happened to the Von Eriks? From Dean Hart to Matt Annis to Davy Boy Smith to Dynamite Kid to Owen Hart. I don't know how, but is there some kind of correlation as it regards wrestling families? Anyway, you'll be missed and we probably won't feel the true impact of this tragedy for years to come. Chris Morris. Pendicton, British Columbia. While my opinion of the media seems to get worse every day, nothing seems to crystallize that point of view like the death of Owen Hart. While everyone wants to point the finger at Vince McMahon, which isn't to say he doesn't have some of it coming, I feel that on the whole the WWF has handled the aftermath about as well as a company possibly could have. I felt that in many ways your coverage was overly critical and failed to present several viewpoints from the other side. In regards to continuing the show, I spoke to several police officers and they felt that continuing the show and not informing the crowd was the right decision to make. The Kansas City Police Department no doubt had to conduct an investigation after the show. To continue the show and not inform the crowd would most likely get the crowd out of the building as quick as possible and without an incident. Who could say what would have happened if they had stopped the show and sent everyone home? Some curious people would have hung around, as would people concerned about getting a refund, there would have possibly been a riot. If you've attended a live WWF event recently, you'd know the crowd is always unruly and not respectful at all. Even if that wasn't the case, both Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff said they wouldn't stop the show. You yourself said it took you several hours to come to that conclusion. The WWF is a million-dollar company that was about to face a media frenzy in two hours, whether they stopped the show or not. The people in charge only had five minutes to make a decision. I doubt anyone could do much better under the circumstances. In regards to the Steve Austin beer tribute, which you stated seemed like something designed to get the company over, could you imagine the outcry if Austin, the top man in the company, had done nothing? People would say how appalling that he couldn't put his personal problems with Owen aside to honor a fallen co-worker. He said nothing that would have made him sound phony and offered a simple gesture of respect. I don't think it could have been handled better. Everyone is on the bandwagon lambasting the Raw show for exploiting Owen's death. Every time a wrestler dies people cry more should be done to honor them. Yet when more is done, they are charged with exploiting the situation. I feel the media has been far more exploitive than the WWF, but nobody mentions that. If this was 1994 when ratings were in the toilet and nobody was watching, this would have been a sidebar story similar to deaths in auto racing and skiing. But now the media is all over it because wrestling is big business. Isn't it just as exploitive to stick a microphone in the face of the Hart family members than that day when they were clearly in the middle of a grieving process, just as you obviously did with Bruce, so we can get juicy yet tasteless sound bites likening Owen's death to the Simpson murders? Even if Bruce had called you, for you to print his comments was lacking in journalistic ethics. I thought it was pretty tasteless of you to critique the wrestler's comments on Raw saying certain people stole the show. I would hope that they were all legitimate heartfelt comments that didn't need analysis.
Owen wasn't dead for half a day when the Hart family was paraded around television so everyone could see them, their emotions still raw and solicit comments about the evil circus master that killed their brother in the quest for ratings. You want exploitive? How about WCW? They mentioned Owen's death more times on one show than they mentioned the last three deaths in their own promotion. You can't say it wasn't because of the media attention. How about Hulk Hogan, who called the WWF 30 porno wrestling at the same time the Owen tribute was airing, then showed up at the funeral and talked to every camera in the place saying he was a lifelong friend of the Hart family. Doesn't Brett hate Hogan? Seems awfully similar to running for president after the Ventura election. He just needed to steal the spotlight. Yet this scarcely receives a mention. The Hart family has blamed the push for ratings as the cause for Owen's death. The media in its ignorance has taken that as the reason for Owen's death. Owen's ring entrance was never hyped as a reason to buy the show. His character was hardly even pushed. How can anybody say it was for ratings? It had been performed numerous times by Sting, Michaels, Undertaker and Owen himself and nobody was saying it was too dangerous back then. It was a freak accident. It occurred during something that had been performed so many times that someone, whether it be Owen or the Riggers, had forgotten the danger that was involved. Does McMahon deserve heat? Absolutely. One of his wrestlers died on his show. Does he deserve the attacks thrown at him by the media and the Hart family? I don't think so. I know I'll get crucified for this, but I can't help but wonder what the Hart family reaction would have been had Brett still been employed by the WWF. Michael Kingston. Syracuse, New York. Response from Dave Meltzer. I spoke to police officers who can't figure out how the Kansas City police allowed the crime scene to become contaminated by not stopping the show and conducting the investigation. Paul Heyman told me if it happened on his show, he wouldn't stop it. But when we discussed McMahon's situation, which was different than a situation would be with him, he wasn't sure of what his decision would be but leaned toward not stopping. Bischoff didn't give an answer on CNN. He didn't say he wouldn't stop the show. He waffled and didn't give an answer and was trying to do what he considered as damage control for the business as a whole. Every promoter I spoke with, except two, since that time said they wouldn't stop the show and the reason every one of them gave was money and nothing more and that's what the public and media thought as well and that's how the situation was judged. There would have been no outcry had Austin not been involved in the Raw show. What was the public outcry of Vince McMahon or Undertaker not saying, or doing any kind of a demonstration on that show? None. What was the outcry when Austin, who was strongly encouraged to go, didn't attend the funeral? From a media standpoint none, in fact, even though he didn't go, it was reported as if he did. The Austin tribute that was clearly choreographed and contrived, and held off until the end of the show for ratings purposes. Almost nobody outside the industry itself is critical of the Raw show. This is hardly a negative bandwagon. It was a huge success in every way. The only people who were upset are at least a few within the company who contacted us who knew what it was about and 90% of everyone within wrestling we spoke with who lived the mentality and know what it was. As mentioned before, what Owen was designed to do had never been performed by any of the people you mentioned, nor as people have said, was it the same crew that did the sting stunts as people have tried to say. It had no backup so all it took was one thing to go wrong and there would be a tragedy. Owen Hart's tragic death has triggered another wave of what I think is unfair publicity onto the WWF and the frightening number of deaths that have occurred in the industry over the past six years. You recently did a breathtaking analysis on the recent deaths in the industry. Pro wrestling, like any other sport or entertainment entity, has many problems. Drugs and erratic behavior are part of our society, but are certainly too commonplace in pro wrestling. The problem is the blame is heaped upon Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff over the continuing pattern of deaths. To wrestling's detractors and even yourself, the wrestling industry is one that includes not only WWF, WCW All Japan, and New Japan but smaller companies that employed little-known deceased grapplers like Shane Shamrock and Neil Superior, even Art Barr and Eddie Gilbert, as good as they are as performers and as well-known as they were to wrestling fans, were working for smaller less significant promotions when they died. That would be like holding the National Football League accountable for the Canadian Football League, arena football, college and high school programs. Looking over the observer's list of high-profile deaths, the only one from the WWF locker room before Owen Hart over the past six years was Brian Pillman. For WCW, they had Louis Spicoli, Rick Williams, and Rick Rude. Is this good? Obviously no. We are talking about human lives. But sports and entertainment are littered with drug abuse and problems. In the past six months, a star on Suddenly Susan committed suicide and Dana Plato of Different Strokes committed suicide and a former NFL player was arrested for murder in New Jersey. 
two of the deaths the observer related to steroids, Larry Cameron and John Studd, were 41 and 46 and long past their wrestling primes. Imagine if they were football players instead of wrestlers. Their careers would have been over and they may still have died from complications from steroids. Would their deaths be credited to the NFL? Lyle Lozato and Steve Corson are two high-profile ex-NFL players who died of possible steroid complications after they retired. Both were very public in blaming steroid abuse for their health problems. There was no outcry involving steroids in the NFL. A friend of mine stated the NFL would have gotten far more publicity if a player anywhere near the equivalent stature of Owen Hart was killed. That's undeniably correct. But what if someone in the Arena Football League or Carolina League in baseball had overdosed? Would it get more publicity than Shane Shamrock or Neil Superior? Certainly not among your readers or those in Phil Mushnick's column. The WWF certainly gets a free pass compared to the NFL on certain things, like the failure of drug testing or the commission of crimes. The NFL gets a free pass on incidents that happen in major college programs while the WWF seems to be lumped with every minor league promotion when something goes wrong like the aforementioned deaths. Every year a number of high school football players die. Should we blame the NFL and Paul Tagliabu for this? The NFL can't be responsible for what a high school coach in New Jersey or a Division III coach in Wisconsin is doing. Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff can't be blamed for poor working conditions in Mexico or Puerto Rico or something a small independent promotion is doing. They can only be blamed for what is done in their respective locker rooms. While there is plenty of room for improvement, it's no different than the NFL, NBA, baseball or any major Hollywood studio. If you look at each of those major industries, you'd be shocked at how closely it mirrors pro wrestling. I think the biggest problem in wrestling is the lack of an off-season. Could you imagine the level of pain killer abuse if football was played 52 weeks a year? Statistically, you're comparing the entire wrestling industry against the NFL and MLB. That's unfair and inaccurate. A better comparison would be WWF and WCW against one league. The numbers are still worse in wrestling, but not to the glaring degree portrayed. The irony is that Hart's death was the only recent one that was in no way a result of a behavior problem. John McMullen. Westchester, Pennsylvania. Response from Dave Meltzer. Actually if you limit comparisons to only WWF and WCW and not wrestling as a whole, things look far worse. There are about 80 wrestlers under contract to WCW and about 55 to WWF. Over the past 20 months five of them have died not including a former wrestler working for WCW as a referee, and there have been several other near misses like car wrecks and overdoses including one where a guy's heart stopped beating. That's one death out of every 27 wrestlers and several near misses dating back 20 months so on an annual basis that amounts to one death in 45 over the course of a one-year period, roughly 24 times the death rate of men in the same age bracket in society as a whole. I don't care if you're talking rock stars, TV actors, stuntmen Russian Olympic stars from the 60s, or race car drivers, I don't think if you go back 20 months in any of those professions at the major league level and you'll have one out of every 27 performers dead and if you did it would have to be viewed as a profession that also needs reforms. If you want to compare television actors then one in every 45 television stars, the oldest being 40, would have to have died during the past calendar year to make it an equal comparison and if that was the case, it would only prove there are also major problems in that profession. Of the TV stars you are pointing out, there were two suicides, one of whom was current and the other whose TV fame on different strokes was about two decades ago, both of which got tons of press coverage. Fact is, there was 1,000 times the press coverage to Alzado's death and scrutiny of the NFL's drug programs and drug testing than to Studd's death and scrutiny of the WWF and pro wrestling in general even though both situations were similar, except what Alzado died from has never been linked to steroids except by his personal physician while what Studd died from has. And both were similar level of stars in their respective profession, but football is more high profile than pro wrestling and thus gets more negative press and criticism when something goes wrong. Corson is still alive, although he has had severe heart problems. Thanks for your excellent Owen Hart obituary. It was truly sad to be there live in Kansas City. There have been far too many deaths in wrestling in the past few years, but this was much worse. A clean living family man dying over something so stupid. The tribute show was very nice, even if it was only damage control on Vince McMahon's part. It really sucked that they didn't stop the show. We traveled more than 600 miles to see it. How were we supposed to enjoy it? But it was even worse watching the replay on television. A man dies and Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler have to sell Vince having a broken ankle. They show Triple H smashing up a casket. Continuing the show live was bad enough, but the context of the television show made it 10 times worse. 
there was no sensitivity whatsoever. My friend, who didn't go to Kansas City or watch the pay-per-view was ready to quit watching wrestling over it. Owen was never the top guy in the company but he was the favorite of many and will be missed. Steve Lockwood. Shoreview, Minnesota. Whether it's the clash of titans in the ring or the drama that unfolds outside it, we're here to break it down, match by match, feud by feud. Remember, in the world of wrestling, every day is a battle, and every victory is a story waiting to be told. Until next time, keep the passion alive, and never stop wrestling with the possibilities. This is the Pro Wrestle Machine. <laughs>